morning, everybody. Today is Monday. I want to say it's the 5th. Is it the 5th, guys? It fifth. is the 5th. It is the 5th. Today, Three, four, five, this fifth. is uh, MMA Junkie Radio's pre-show, the show before the show. I am Ghost. To my left, Dan Tom, MMA Junkie Radio's fight analyst. Woo! And George should be here shortly. Back in New York, producer Danny Otto, the host yeah. of Danny's Stupid Show. Yeah. That's not what it's called. That's Danny's true. Dumb Show, sorry. Yeah, that's what it's yeah, called. That's what it's called. <laughs> Poppin' pop zits with Ashley. Yeah. I would not be able to watch that show. You wouldn't? I can't do you don't watch those videos where people are popping zits? I can't. Oh, gosh. No. Seems like something goes to be into. I, I can't oh. look away. I can't watch those. I can't. One day I'll have I, to explain I don't. why we say I can't. One day. One <laughs> we're day. allowed to explain, right? We don't have time today, but we're allowed okay. to, right? Uh, people are allowed to explain things aside from me because if I'm explaining something, it's probably not going to be good. Junkie Nation, if you guys are ever around and you can't do something, you have to say, I can't. I can't. You have to say it like that. <laughs> That'll make us laugh. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Sometimes, like, some of the stupid stuff we say on the show are just jokes from, like, when we were in junior high or elementary. <laughs> so every once in a while, my, word, my world will collide and uh, a junkie will meet somebody that I grew up with and they'll hear you guys say stuff and they'll start laughing and like why is he saying that and I'm like it's a long story you know the story you know the star coming, <laughs> coming up in a minute one minute his life got flipped turned this upside George. down he's from the Coove. the Coove. yep the Coove's in the house he's gonna ask he's gonna ask he's gonna ask you know Jason yeah yeah you're from Canada. Yeah, he is. You guys excited about Lombard in the studio? Yeah. He should be yeah. Oh, I did figure out that thing, by the way. Did you? Yeah. But So but you have the you, Fox you, thing queued up? When you do... No. Uh, so that's what I was going to ask you. Where to find it, and when we do it, we have to take a break before and after. Do it. Because we have to reset. I guys. find it at Fox Sports. They, Coming up. They had Stand by. So you gotta let us know when you're gonna do it. We gotta take a break before yeah. and after. Do it. This is your captain speaking. We are making our descent into Las Vegas McCarran Airport. On behalf of our crew, we'd like to thank you for flying MMA Junkie Airlines. Now please fasten your seatbelts and put your tray tables in your upright position because the descent is gonna be a little bit bumpy. <laughs> All right, Junkie Nation, it's time to roll, baby, on MMA Junkie Radio with Gorgeous George and Go. This is what we do and why we do it, baby. All night long, we roll it! Yes! The MMA Junkie Radio revolution is upon us. Can you dig it? There's no escape. No escape. Through the vast frontier of cyberspace and through a sea of stars in outer space. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. We've solidified our combat communication stranglehold. We are controlling transmission. With the use of MMA Junkie Radio and Sirius XM satellite radio technology. MMA Junkie Radio. Commence transmission. Live from MMA Junkie Radio HQ in the fight capital of the world, Las Vegas, Nevada. Here are your hosts, Cortis George and Goes. From the fight capital of the world inside the beautiful Mandalay Bay Race and Sportsbook, you are listening to the MMA Junkie Radio Show, the only show that matters. I'm your host, Gorgeous George. With me as always is the devious and dastardly Goes, Ari's co-host. To my left, it's the fight analyst, Dan Tom, and back he's handling all the producing duties. Danny Otto joining us. What's up, guys? What up? What's going on? Not Morning. much. Not much. Just some fights to talk about from I this can't past weekend. That long. Right. Yeah. It was UFC 222 that was in the house, as well as Bellator 195 the night before. Want to talk about all of it. Check and see how y'all's weekend went. Got some in studio people here. You said something about the Coob is in the house? The Coob is in the house. The Coob's in the house. Showtime's in the house. Kevin Lee's not here, though. Them two are never going to meet. I'm telling never. you. It's not going to happen. One it's better that way, Showtime. Just he's 
the one guy that happens to not be kind of like uh, Home Improvement. You can never see the neighbor. Wilson. Wilson. Yeah. Yeah. One of those things. Yeah. There's what, a reason what for is, that. Uh, is there a nickname for like Tennessee? The what? Mm. Does Tennessee have a nickname? Like you know how they're the Coove? What are what's Tennessee? Well, he's from Chattanooga. The Nuga? The Chatta? Yeah, Chattanooga. The Choo Choo. Chattanooga. Choo That's longer than Chattanooga. The Nug. The Nug. But nickname's got to be shorter. Choo Choo. Choo Choo. All right. Lakers fan. That's a dope hat he's got on. Yeah. Yeah. Lakers, by the way, went into San Antonio. Notice Ray from San Antonio was hasn't been chirping too much. Took them fools out. I'm telling you, they're getting better. Next year's going to be our year. All right. So UFC 222. Chris Cyborg defended her world title against Yana Kunitskaya. Now, Yana Kunitskaya was not just the lamb that was slaughtered. In the end, it kind of appeared that way. But she actually fought back, you know. And even early on, threatened by taking Chris's back, she just couldn't get both hooks in at the same time, but attempted both the left leg and the right leg, just couldn't do it. But it would have been interesting if she maybe would have had that backpack position similar to Carmouche. Remember, she almost spoiled Ronda Rousey's, yeah. uh, the debut of women's MMA in, in the Ultimate Fighting Championship. Mm -hmm. Just that one moment where you all <gasps> hold your breath, like, what could happen? Is this it? Buster Douglas versus Tyson. But instead, Cyborg kind of uh, fought it off. And she did it kind of with a smile. Almost like, that's cute, but watch me get out of this, and then I'll come back and blaze you. Now, what got her into that mess was her just delivering a big right hand. I think sending a message to Kunis guy who had said, you know, she wasn't really too threatened by Chris's uh, power. But, man, she felt it. She got Oof. knocked back. And that caused her on instinct to grab a single. And then from there, all that other sequence worked its way out. But you know what, man? That, that uh, you know, so she was a minus 2,000 favorite here at Mandalay Bay. And, and I think it went as low as minus 1650. Some Kunis guy money came in. But the fight played out kind of like how we all thought. But at least there was that one moment. Where she almost threatened from the back, and, and that's all you can ask for. I mean, they put this fight together three weeks I, ago. I thought it was actually more dangerous when she actually took her down. And I thought, yeah, well, could yeah. We, could we possibly see her maybe ride out this position and win a round here? Uh, when, you got, when she got her back, you're right. She kind of had that smile, and you could just kind of tell she wasn't going to be in trouble. But the first punch that she took, she just had this look like, I was not expecting this uh -huh. kind of power. Yeah. And that's when you kind of knew her, her ticket had been punched. Yeah, uh, Dan. What would you think of the fight? You know, it. it Members only's in the house. Yeah, I know. Nice. I, found, I found this. I, 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 Good job. I, yeah, I know. I feel like that dude from Stranger Things. I was like, oh, I found this members only jacket. It's like Is the eighties. Doc 80s. Brown outside or what? I think so. Don't get me started on Doc. You know, I, you know, <laughs> you know my thoughts on Doc Brown. Let's not go there. Um, but it, it, speaking of equally, it did, it did get a bit dark though for uh, Kunitskaya. She did have her moments, like George said. But it's tough, man. It, it, it's tough to not to not feel that way. I, I was really trying to stay optimistic going in, you know, uh, uh, breaking down Kunitskaya's skill sets in my breakdown. You know, um, it, she's a skilled martial artist. She's well-rounded. We, we saw the extent of her well-roundedness. She's not just a kickboxer, right? She went for the back. But I don't blame people for, you know, feeling like they just watched that the, 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 the goat being l lured down to the Tyrannosaurus Rex in Jurassic Park mm -hmm. because it had it did have that feel to it, too. So I'm not going to I'm not going to sit there and tell people are crazy for feeling that way. But, yeah, I think you brought up some good points. She did have some, some moments, and I think we should just give her a fair shake at 135. Clearly, I th it's hard to have expectations too high for Kunitskaya, right? And if her expectations are, aren't, aren't too high, how much can we really hammer down on her for this? Right, I it doesn't mean she sucks. Yes. See, the minus 2,000 led you to believe, like, the other chick must suck. Yeah. And Kunitskaya is a, is a, is a good 135-er who I think is just pro still proving herself. Yes. She's, now she's coming over from Invicta. Now she's in the UFC. Now she'll drop back to her weight class. And now we'll see... You know, if she's a contender or if she'll just be uh, maybe just a good fighter that maybe doesn't get a, ever, ever get a title shot. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean you're a bad fighter. It just means that that's the career you chose and you were one of the best at, at some point. You know, maybe top five, top ten, whatever. The women's divisions are a little bit easier because they're just not as deep. So Kunitskaya, you know, she'll take that loss, dust herself off. I don't think there was any serious injuries and then come back and, and we'll see what's left. As for Cyborg, she racked up another 500,000 plus pay-per-views. She's just getting more popular, more popular, and now she's in line for... Maybe Amanda Nunes, which, by the way, we can get into that because Nunes and Pennington was set. But the hot ticket on Saturday night seemed to be Cyborg versus Nunes. You know, what was talked about earlier uh, a few months ago. And Dana White reaffirmed that that really, really piques his interest. Now, a couple things on that, since I think we're done talking about the fight itself, right? Yeah. A couple things on that. Pennington is, look, Dana doesn't have, like, best friends that are fighters. I think he's, if you were to pick 12 fighters that Dana would take to a fight, if he had an extra ticket and he knew the fighter was in town, 
I think Pennington would be one of them, like a boxing match. I believe so, too. I think Pennington, uh, Yair. Yeah, yeah, there's Yair. a few of them that he's got that are, like, favorites. He's always like Raquel Pennington. So think about how much he must be into this fight if he's willing to take that away from one of his favorites, the fight that she's already got set versus Amanda Nunes, and say, nah, you know, I'm, I'm kind of more hip to this other one. Now, they do need a main event for Rio de Janeiro. I guess you could go with Machida and Belfort. That's not a pay-per-view main event. That's a fight night main event, but it's not a pay-per-view main event. So I don't think they're going to. So this one could fit the bill to Brazilian ladies duking it out. But just like all the other champions, they all want to be on the fight card here in Las Vegas mm -hmm. um, for International Fight Week because that's going to be the big Stipe Cormier fight, the one that tab to have the highest pay-per-views all year until Connor says, hey, I'm back. Until then, it seems like that one may, I don't know, uh, what's that, 500000 750 I really don't know what that one could be. But it's International Fight Week. Sounds like it could be a stack card, and they all want to be there. But interesting to note that he was willing to take away Pennington shot. Yeah. Uh, look, I think that fight made sense when there was nobody there for Cyborg to fight. But if Megan Anderson throws up her hand That's another and, one, yeah. and actually she is did. ready to go, then I don't see why you don't do that fight. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm down with him pulling it apart. But, yeah, you, you have to think if Dana says that, he says it for a reason. Dana's usually a guy to maybe keep it close to his vest. Or if anything, he'll do counterintelligence, right? He'll tell us one thing. But it's really the other, and he does like Penn Pennington. You, you know that that was that was a good good point there. So I got to imagine that if he's gonna make it happen, Dana White usually comes strong at the table. If he if he does commit to something, right? Yeah. So if he does want that matchup to happen, I think he's gonna make sure that it happens in Rio, and maybe you know quell with cash any kind of uh, any kind of uh, want for the July car from either either the two contestants to make them happy enough to take that Rio slot. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I got to imagine. Or he could just tell him. You know, uh, I mean, that could happen. Right. Or I could just tell him, you're just fighting there. Enough with the sprinkling. If it works out, <laughs> it works out. But, you know, he could very easily just go, guess what? I haven't put you on that July card. Now we're looking into August. And I think the girls would then go back and go, shit, we should have fought at Rio. You know what I mean? I think yeah. when it's appropriate, yeah. do it. Um, and then when it's not, but, you know, I, I don't know. I think Rio for both of them mm -hmm. seems good. Uh, it's It would really, really suck for Pennington because she, she had the fight book one other time and she broke her leg. And so now it'd be booked again, and they'd be taking it apart. But I'd really love to see uh, that fight. I think it's a hot ticket. And here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking as all this is playing out, I don't know if they still have their director in, of Brazil for the UFC. Remember they had someone that was just in charge of Brazil? Yeah. They went through like three of them. And I don't know if they have a current person, because I thought I heard the Sao Paulo offices were skimmed down or closed. I don't know. But someone's over there going, man, this thing's blowing up on Google Brazil or or I'm here, you know, this this is a hot ticket. And they're communicating to him via text or WhatsApp or something saying, if you can make this fight, I'm telling you this is the one. Something like that had to have happened. Yeah, you got to imagine. I mean. Or do you want to see P Pennington and Nunes? I mean, because she does deserve the shot. It's not like she, she does. deserves it. And I, I think they're both sides have contenders. And really, we're only supposed to look at these fights when somebody's just been on a massive roll. And Amanda Nunes is look good. But I don't think she's at that point yet where we need to say, there's nobody left for her to fight. There's somebody right in front of her. There's somebody right in front of Cyborg. You got to make that fight happen first. Both Nunes fights. and Cyborg. No, you got to make those fights happen first. Oh, Megan. First. And then, yeah, you okay. then you come to that. Let's story. tackle Megan. So she was active on social media. Uh, I think she could have worded it a little bit different, but she almost made it sound like, uh, hey, y'all stop tripping out there. How about me? I'm here. I think she's even pointing at herself in a meme or a, a cartoon or something. And I'm thinking, uh, hang on a second. They've tried. They've they've tried this, and you couldn't do it. So if you're back, I'm happy for you. I really do want to see that fight. I think she's a quality 145er, but it came across almost like y'all been tripping. I've been sitting here, and you haven't given me a shot. And mm -hmm. from from all accounts, I've heard that they wanted to include her, and somehow she just couldn't. You know. So the good thing is she's resolving any issues she has. So you're saying Megan versus Cyborg, Nunes yeah. versus Pennington. Yeah, yeah I could do that too. Make that happen. And then if the two winners win, now it's even bigger. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't hate either way. Usually I'm on that side, but this is actually one of the cases though where I will say I wouldn't be completely upset. I wouldn't be like, This is a travesty. He's on a seven fight win streak. He should be in the shot at the time. Like, I don't I don't think there's any of that at play. But I also agree that, you know, Nunez hasn't been at that level where she's super fight status, whereas Chris clearly is by virtue of no other options, That's but, but deserve thing. it as well. That's yeah. the thing. I'm waiting in about a week or two, those preliminary numbers will come out. Mm. And if Chris sold well, 
that's it, man. She's going to be one of those that kind of controls yeah. a little bit. You know, has a little bit of pull. Amanda hasn't proven that yet, but Chris is – the card she's on seemed to keep going up a little bit more, a little bit more, so she just could have that it factor that – that uh well, I mean, I, enough with the Tyson comparisons. We, we've made that many times with many fighters. But, you know, on the female side, just somebody that's mm -hmm. destructive. Yeah. And you, you can't just, miss. You Must just see. hear the name, right? You it's see a great it name. Sports Center, and it just makes you want to wonder, like, who is this girl? I mean, she's got so much going for her. Yeah, she really does. Um, all right. In the Comey event, Frankie wow. Edgar loses to Brian Ortega. Now, a second ago, I said, you know, Kunitsky only had three-week notice. Um, you know, all that other stuff. This isn't apples to apples, but some things kind of measure up. Ortega only had three three weeks notice. He's a quality uh, fighter, you know. So is Unitskaya. But Unitskaya was moving up a division. Uh, anyway, Edgar fights Frankie Edgar, and he puts him away. Now, I think some of us said, I'll give credit to a few people. I think Jonathan McDonald from uh, South Carolina, now living in Vegas. And one other guy, Michael Nagy, uh, from South Carolina as well. I know. Couple Rob guys. Robertson and Dante Morgan called that. They exactly called it. Exactly the way it went. Oh, they called it by KO, though? Yeah. By KO. Yeah, wow. I know, I know because uh, Noah Hubs, Buffalo Blue, and I offered to buy those guys pizza when they get here if that were to happen, and they didn't take us on that bet. Wow. Oh, uh, so there was one of those like, eh, if they remember, I'm calling it. If they don't, yeah. nobody will say anything. No, no, they, they did make it a, a point to say this is what we think. They just didn't. But bet. they weren't so sure that they weren't willing to take a pizza bet? Well, I think they just thought it was dumb because we're never really all in the same spot. I see. All right. Well, anyway, um, he did it. <laughs> he knocked them out. He didn't submit them. He knocked them out. What, first round too, right? Mm -hmm. First round. What the fuck? I couldn't believe it. The crowd was just silenced. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of Frankie Edgar fans. Not that there isn't Ortega. But let, uh, Edgar has really, really made his mark in the sport as a former champion at 155 pounds, as a contender at 45, as a tough Jersey kid who never backs down from anyone, who's beaten the likes of Sean Shirk and Cub Swanson and BJ Penn. I mean, he has quite a list himself. And Ortega skinned him, man. Knocked him out, lifted him off his feet. Dude, it, it, sorry, a any problems with the stoppage, guys? <coughs> Fuck no, he no. was gone. Some, pe some people were, were screaming that. But too the early? The only or reason they we were saying that was too early. The only reason they were saying that is just because of what Frankie's done in the past. Mm. I mean, you see Frankie, when he sets up, he's kind of doing it. But when you go back and watch that replay, I thought it was spot on. The elbow wobbled. The uppercut knock, knocked him out because you could see his face was a concussed fighter. Mm -hmm. And then the follow-ups, as soon as he gets there, I think the referee's already like, unless this guy's grabbing for a single or an immediate some sort of a cover-up, that's it, you know. So he gave him that chance, and boom, as soon as the hammer fists come in, that's the right follow-up. I had no problem with it. your career. Right? It could take years off of your career. So yeah. I thought it was perfect. Shocker, wasn't it? Big time. Yeah, man. I mean, just kind of going through the, the Frankie Edgar fights I, I've watched, and I kind of go through them, and I've been, I've been at four now, and they are all four very different types of Fra Frankie Edgar, right? We had the, the Gray Maynard UFC 125, their second fight. And in that fight, that's when one they reference, and that's where people maybe will make the argument, oh, you should have given Frankie a little more respect. Look what he took against Gray. But whether Frankie was doing a back roll, a barrel roll, a front roll from the shots that he was getting hit with Gray, he was still in motion. He was getting up. He was scrambling. There was never that dead mo dead in motion. Defensive instincts. Right. Yeah. And Frankie was dead in motion, not just falling down to the floor, but even midair from the uppercut. You see him do that stiff move midair where there was a lot of dead in motion even while he was in motion, which is the body language that ref is looking for uh, when they're going to be heavy on the step in, right? Yeah. So by that issue, I definitely have no issue. But it's crazy because, again, let's just go through the timeline. Saw Frankie at, at 125, you know, defend the title, uh, you know, a G uh, go through go through that crazy crazy thing with gray you know you see him you know put down my favorite a legend where it kind of became a, a, a reality if you weren't already sold that okay maybe bj's best days are behind him so i'm at that that tough finale with you guys there right we, we, the, we, we, we the see, third one we see frankie uh, put him out um the third one i saw frankie against aldo so i've seen we see, i've seen him been, been shut down no, i mean the third pen fight you were talking about a uh, third pen oh, fight third, yeah third, and then the, 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 then the third frankie fight i see so I, I, now i've seen him seen him rocked against gray but now we see him just outclass and defensively shut down and, and one of the most defensive master classes any matchup jose aldo versus frankie edgar two was there at ufc 200 watching that one so i saw what it was like to see frankie get shut down but then to see frankie you know i tweeted he, the guy who never gets stopped gets knocked out by the submission phenom you know, knocks the submission phenom knocks out the perennial contender who's never been stopped in a fight. It, like it just kind of that encapsulates how crazy the sport is that we follow. It was man, it was something else. I couldn't believe that that happened. Frankie, I thought was 
boxing well, moving yeah. well, footwork, kind of doing what he does, you know, a little bit of a dissection here and there. And Ortega was pretty much a dance partner, but taking things very, very slow. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden, just I, I, I had no reaction other than <gasps> couldn't believe what I saw, you know. Um, and it, it's, you know, that, that whole Monday morning quarterback and the I told you so's, I'm going to skim over it, you know, um, but it, but I feel like as a fan and someone who covers the sport, I have mm -hmm. to say it. Okay. That's what I felt like just could happen because the sport's so crazy, and that's what our, our guest on Thursday, Mark Henry, what I was trying to convey to him was as a business decision, is this too risky? Like now they have the feeling of how it feels and what it does and what the climb will be. At the time, you're thinking, man, this is our guy. He just doesn't lose these fights and blah, blah, blah. But at some point, Frankie doesn't have to prove how tough he is. You know what I mean? No one's going to say he pulled out. What a puss. No one's going to say that. You know, or, or he's got so much respect in the game that he really could have just waited Holloway out. Holloway's going to be ready to go in Chicago. Right. That's only a few months. That's a, a, a business decision that Frankie would have earned at this point if he wanted to pull out. But that's all I'll say because he, a grown man, made a decision, got to respect it, and it's just one that didn't work out for him. But, you know, here we are. He's got to uh, regroup. Well, yeah, now he, now he gets shuffled back down. But what do we do with Brian Ortega? Cause he gets Holloway. Thing. Here's the thing. He's got the finishes. But it's not like he dominates people. So, do you guys have like, is he a star? Are you kidding? Getting me? ready to make, uh, well, like domination round by round. He's oh, round okay, round. okay, like yeah, a fifty forty five rounds. Yeah. Okay. What do we have with him? Is he a guy that we could sell for a championship fight, but probably not anywhere after that? Like, is he being fed? No. You think he'll be around then? He's, he's yeah, the guy yeah. Be a name for a while. Yeah, he's undefeated, and he's you know his hands have improved a lot in the last few years. He's not just a submission artist, but when he does threaten with submissions, I mean, he really, really becomes okay. You know, uh, a snake. I mean, he wraps himself around you, and you saw what he did to Cub man with the re grip, just as he was in his guard. Um, you know, throwing his legs back up there, making things tighter. I mean, not too many guys do that, and he was able to do it. He's he's just. Uh, I, I, his striking against Moicano I thought was pretty sharp in, in Anaheim so um, he just continues to get better but how about this his ground game is so respected that I thought Frankie had an, sorry if I spit on you uh, Frankie had an opportunity to take him to the ground and he thought thought twice about it you know what I mean so that's how tight this guy's game is that a guy like Frankie Edgar who's very comfortable down there a black belt his own under Henzo Gracie decided now nah, now's not the time and stayed with the boxing and you know yeah. uh, I don't know I, I think Ortega's for real well, yeah what I'm getting at guys yeah, is yeah. now that we've lost some stars are we replacing them does Brian Ortega replace somebody that's left does Francis Ngannou is the UFC doing a better job of what we were kind of complaining about needing to create new stars are these people cutting it these new people? I'm down with those two you just named. I think they could become stars. Yeah? Yeah. But you got to win. As a Valentina Shevchenko, I as she even crossed no. over. Like, I feel like there's a lot of people that aren't getting the respect that they deserve. And John is not big and powerful. Name, but, but I think they're marketable. And I yes. think they're doing a, a, a better job of what they get criticized for. Yeah. No, they uh, the stars are coming. They're delivering. McKenzie I don't know that the UFC really, do, really does much. I think I think what they do is they'll say, "Hey, Megan, interview these people." What they have these little specials on on the website, but again, I, I think it's mostly gonna have to come from the fighters themselves, their performances. The UFC will put you in those positions to succeed, but I, I just don't know what else the UFC can really uh, really do much um, mm -hmm. other than just continuously talk about you. Well, the in general part of it is a big conversation, so I don't know if we want to uh, we want to go all the way down that road. But uh, my opinion on that has always been the same. We need to make roads for these guys. Now there are solid roads that goes just pointed to, but my opinion, in a nutshell, n still not enough roads. Because I also agree with Goes is that there's a lot of fighters that aren't that deserve it that arguably aren't getting it. Now as far as Goes' original question about the guy at hand here, Brian T. City Ortega, I'm actually r working on uh, polishing off an article that that, that hopefully uh, will, will be uh, in and out soon here. Uh, about Brian Ortega. Now, I don't know, obviously. None of us know how big his ceiling will go. But speaking of that dynamic of 
the things of you know well he 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 not, he's not he's not exactly dominating these fights until he gets it and will that play a factor in this these talks because those are real talks you know when we're making these picks the reason why I pick against Ortega and a lot of people do is because we're like well how long can he go with continuing to lose rounds and just pulling it out this is the highest level he's facing the best guys everybody's got to take that first loss you can't be undefeated forever but here he is doing his thing and I'm actually doing a comparison article for, you know, to athletes uh, in particular in history that have been able to be these anomalies, like, for example, not to tip my hand too much, but like a Babe Ruth, where, you know, failures and successes kind of go hand in hand. And some of the greatest guys are like that. Or comparing them to clutch athletes like Reggie Miller, you know, guys that could always, you know, even if they weren't championship guys or the best guys, they were able to capture the imagination because they came through a clutch. And everybody, doesn't matter what sport, everybody can appreciate a clutch player and a home run hitter. I think we can all agree on that. T-City's doing the right things. He's beating popular fighters in the right spots, uh, you know. He's got, I think he's got one of the cooler jackets. I saw that thing and the, and the t-shirt, the one that talks about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and surfing. Yeah. It's, it's uh, black color. I saw a lot of there's a lot of those out there. I think he's saying the right things in the post-fight speeches. Um, I also think he's doing good stuff in the press conferences, you know, talking about working with kids. Um, he's got the look. I mean, he's been featured in the Nas commercial. They didn't pick his name out of a hat. He's a good-looking dude, you know. Uh, in the post-fight press conference, his Spanish was actually better than a lot of the Mexican Americans that I've heard in the past that have had that opportunity to reach a broader audience, and yet they're sitting there tripping over words and just you know I, you can tell that it, it's not a good communication. And mm -hmm. him and Gaslam, him and Gaslam have improved, have impressed me a lot. You know, he's got a cool um, first name. What I would do, you know, I mean, this, yeah, you're right. We'll tackle this another day. If there's ever been any more thoughts or contributions on what the UFC can do, I'd like to hear it, but maybe put in Brian Ortega um, on a Spanish podcast, just for one, tell Fabricio or Marlon Vera, hey, take the night off, we want to feature this guy, you know, maybe that might be a way, or or maybe Nganu or or, uh, or, or um, Shevchenko or, or Ortega or somebody else uh, as a coach on a season of Toph, you know, yeah, we, there's a few of those ideas that we have, but other than that, the fighters are going to have to do a lot of it themselves. He said he did a broadcasting, and, we, and last year uh, he did an interview on a, on, on a Brendan Schaub's podcast, and was talking about doing um, doing that for the UFC. He said he he was doing it already for the broadcast, but I never heard anything about that. The only guy I've heard them use was, was uh, Vaikov Oliver Doom, and then uh, of course Marlon Vera more now. Um, but See I how Vera went after it though. Yeah. He insisted. He insisted. He insisted, yeah, and yeah. he got it. That's why you got to be aggressive on it. You just can't hang back uh, and let them come to you. Sean O'Malley defeated Andre Sukumta. We'll do this one and then take a break. Okay. Um, your thoughts on that fight, uh, Sukumta? Man, he. You know, he could have won that fight, I believe, by just backing away from the injured yeah. O'Malley, thereby showing the ref that O'Malley had a serious injury, and at that point it would have been a TKO stoppage. Yeah. Um, depending. I mean, I don't know. He hopped on it, but the minute he planted, if he would have fallen, the referee would have taken a serious look. The doctor would have came in and really could have interrupted it. You know, we, we don't know. We don't that, That's the thing. We don't know. But overall, I thought it was a really fun fight. I think they shared the win bonus, but what would you think? I thought he was. I thought Andre was way too tentative at the beginning. Uh, he was just allowing uh, O'Malley to do what he wanted early on. He wasn't pushing a pace that he normally does in his other fights. You're right. At the end, I mean, it's not like uh, we all just look at that today and said that should have been the play. At the moment, everybody was screaming it, and if we're screaming it from our seats, I have to imagine the corner saying the same thing. I don't know why he did that. Yeah, you're right. It, it would have been a win for him. When Sukumta is aggressive like he was in the third, knowing he's got to win the round and put the guy away, he's a very dangerous fighter. When he's countering, he was just letting O'Malley build up too much points, you know, in banking rounds and, mm -hmm. and, and creating damage, too. I mean, he really, really rocked Sukumta in that first round, so that was a lot to come back from. But Even going in the, the end, takedown in round three, like that, it, it he should have known he was down, too. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, I must have been on the same island because uh, I didn't know that his leg was hurt. So I was, I'm, I'm sitting here being a dummy, going, "Hmm, why?" Well, I was saying, "Why is he taking him down?" Because he's down two rounds. Why is he taking him down? So mm -hmm. that er, alone was was kind of you know d doesn't help for the, his argument for fight IQ. And yeah, but I was also there live. I was having some drinks, so forgive me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but I, I think I even tweeted out like, "Hmm, I wonder what this matchmaking is going to be going forward if uh, Malley's getting taken down so easily." But I didn't realize obviously he was on a bum foot. <laughs> Um, and it made for it awesome, by well, the way. Well, it turns out it wasn't broken. So no. we all thought that because I think he said it. He's laying on the ground, and Joe Rogan's bent over interviewing him. Uh, and he, that, that's what he was feeling. But Dana White clarified that in the post-fight press conference that there was no break. So hopefully he comes back sooner rather than later. But, but yeah, just 
um, just just real quick, I just wanted to say, um, yeah, it was super impressed with O'Malley. Like, even though I picked Sukumta, it was one of those fights where it could have gone, you know, either way. You, we just don't know enough about each guy. But what we did know about Sukumta was some questionable fight IQ. And I don't know if you guys picked up on it, but when we were in studio, that was one of the main questions I tried to get on, get, get in front of him was, what are you going to do to make it different in the judge's eyes? Because this is, it's a theme. It, 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 and, it, and people that watch his fights know he's, he's given his fights away before. And there's been excuses. Some have been really bad judging, like the Alejandro Perez fight. Or you, know, you should have been on a little tighter or this or that. But, man, um, and he seemed so confident when he was sitting in that chair. He's like, I got this. I made the adjustments, you know. And I believed him. But that that was that was Five the split decisions on Saturday, by the way. Five. I think that might be the most I've ever seen. Yeah. All right. We got to take a break. You're listening to MMA Chunky Radio on Sirius XM Rush 93. When we come back, we'll take some calls. We'll continue covering uh, UFC 222 and also got to throw something in about Bellator 195. Darian Caldwell, easy work over there defending his title against Leandro Higo and then making a, a nice call out, you know, towards other bantamweights, not just the ones that reside over at Bellator. But you know how it is. They're, they're there. These guys are here. So he may have to have a decision to make at some point if he ever... Uh, goes into free agency and and uh, gets offers, but that, that's a whole other topic. But I do believe Caldwell is one of the better bantamweights in the world, bar none, bar promotion, bar anything. All right, we'll be right back. Stay close.
everything. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right. B.A. Stark. You told me that code would get rid of them. Yeah, well, they're still here. Okay, but now they know I tried to kill them. Hold on, Mom. Here are George and Goes. The Jim Rome Show is now on Sirius XM weekdays at noon Eastern. Catch The Jungle and the rest of the CBS Sports Network on Channel 201 and the Sirius XM app. Let's jump into some calls here. Marco from Waco has been waiting. What's up, Marco? What's on your mind? Marco from Waco Road. Que pasa, Atos? Que pasa, man? Hey, Dan. You know that uh, on the live events, they sell these little headphones that you can listen to the live feed from the commentary. And it works for all the events, man. It's only like 30 bucks. Dude, I got to get that. Bucks. Do you get to keep it or is that a rental? Well, you get to keep it. It works for all the events. Once you buy them once, you can take them to every single event and they work for all the events. Thanks, Marco. Sure. I'm actually going to go to the uh, 223, and I'll be sitting solo, so I actually won't feel like a feel like a jerk if I put one of those in. So no, I was going to say that, that. Yeah. it kind of takes away from um, interaction, socializing, right. and there was like six of us in a row. We were jibber jabbering back and forth, but that that is interesting, I, I suppose. You know, that I've seen people do that at baseball games. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're so into the game, they want to score it. And Mrs. Ferrari used to do that. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Thanks, Marco. I appreciate that. No problem, brother. Hey, uh, getting conversations out of uh, new guys coming into the UFC, uh, Luke Thomas on his post fight was making the point that uh, uh, that was a good night for the UFC. You, you're talking about new talent, man. I mean, of course, Ortega, Sean O'Malley, Lloyd Sugar Cho, and uh, that post fight interview was memorable, dude. It was awesome. The kid had something. He, he got it, man. He, he sparked imagination. He got an exciting fight in the fight. He's like a a uh, small version of the DS brothers, man. Uh, I like Sean O'Malley, but I'm going to follow his career. And then you got this guy, Alexander the Great of Tega, uh, Hernandez. Alexander Hernandez of Merck, uh, Benil Dawiuc. We need the new blood, man. I mean, we got a young freaking uh, champion of featherweight with Max Salloway. I mean, uh, then you got, uh, uh, what is it, uh, on Bantu Way. This one, I always forget his freaking name. Who's that TJ Dillet Show? Tell me, uh, here. Go, uh, Jonas Franklin, Mackenzie Dern, too, Tony right? Yeah, Mackenzie Dern. Yeah, we need all this new talent because, you know, the, the old guy eventually is going to face out. They're going to retire, man. So I am all out for seeing a new blood, man. Is one win sprinkling ta- in talent, though? Yeah, because it it, as long as it sets you up for tomorrow, right? The win sets you up for another opportunity to promote that individual. Because MMA fans and media are so fickle that the minute someone loses, like, I knew it, everyone jumped the, you know, the, the hype train or whatever. Uh, at least O'Malley now has two wins in the UFC and Dana White contender, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, during this was her first one, and she I don't think great. it was close. There were some Yoder calls, but I thought Dern won the fight. But it was within about 30 seconds of if Yoder had done what she did more, I think it was in round two, mm-hmm. it was a very losable fight for Dern. Um, so I think we want to take things slowly uh, with her. Um, what I like about Dern is... You know, like Ortega, she's got this ground game that can really, really cause some trouble for a lot of fighters. And uh, fighters are going to be like, it's almost like going up against the defense that you just can't pass against. It's like, fuck, we just got to run the ball. You know, like something like that. Um, and if she can work on her striking over time, like Verdun. Remember Verdun? I, I think it's gotten a little better in remember the last was fights. just great jiu-jitsu and his striking was like, eh. And then all of a sudden one day pieces up Roy Nelson here at the Mandalay Bay. And we're like, whoa. Cordero. When did you become this Muay Thai guy, you know, that with the hits hard and throws vicious knees and elbows? And, and so if Dern can do something like that, then we got something. But I, I, I would still stop the press a little bit on her. I think O'Malley, though, has, has kind of earned a couple stripes. Uh, real quick, man. Uh, when it comes to Nunez and uh, 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 Nunez and uh, Cyborg, mm. I mean, if they don't do the real card, the USC can always split them. And I said, okay, you fight Raquel Pennington in June, Amanda, and Cyborg, you fight a uh, freaking uh, the, the Australian chicken in August or September. How do you like that? So let's fight in Rio, man. Let's make the fight happen and then sort out the, the rest. And uh, what do you think about the Ante Wilder versus Ortiz, man? Cool. Wilder versus freaking. Uh, Joshua is next. Why the person? Joshua is next. Peace out. All right, we'll see you, bud. Wilder All right. looked wild in some of them, in some of them shots that he was ending the fight with. He was so once he from left field smells the blood. He really, really goes after it. He did that in his previous fight as well. Um, he, I think he likes the the highlight reel finish, and so that's when he really, really mm-hmm. turns it out and empties the gas tank. But Marco brought something up that we discussed earlier, and we should discuss again. Why? Because it's our daily debate. 
Today's MMA Junkie Radio poll question, who do you think should be next for Chris Cyborg? We kind of gave our thoughts early on the show, but let's do it again. Uh, the poll results, Dan Tom, what, what, what did Junkie Nation think of it? Well, out of 1,269 votes, we, Junkie Nation, had 67% for Nunez, 33% for Megan Anderson. So Junkie Nation firmly on the side of Amanda Nunez. You know, I think in Rio de Janeiro, these two ladies, let's do it. Why? Because Cyborg doesn't have the other dance partner just yet. Nunez does, and I hate breaking up fights, but I think there's something there with these two, mm -hmm. and so therefore I think I'm on the side of making the fight happen. Uh, Nunez versus Cyborg. I am against it. I do want to see it eventually, but the whole point of these matchups are based on the fact that just nobody's available, and that's why you have to do it. On both sides, you have two gals that are available. Megan Anderson finally put her hand up, said, I'm ready to go. I want to do this. She is a featherweight, so I think it would be a fun fight. Raquel Pennington is a good challenger as well. As long as there's somebody around, I don't see why we have to make that fight. Would I tune in? Of course I would. But you don't have to do it. I'm all for strengthening the ship of contenders, contender cues, making sure the rankings are in order, making sure we have a good working order to the divisions. But even though I would usually be on the side of, say, uh, let's see some title defenses, let's see some Pennington Nunes, let's see some Megan Anderson Cyborg, I actually wouldn't mind this either because even though it's a Brazilian on Brazilian fight, I feel like the collateral damage would be a lot less as far as we're looking at widespread divisions or holdups. And uh, it could fit, uh, I could think it could fit the ladies' sched uh, schedules, uh, pocketbooks, and, and perhaps promote their status even higher when it's all said and done. I do want to add something to this, though. What Goes is saying, I, I understand because. What you could do is put Megan versus Cyborg as the main event in Rio mm. and put Amanda versus Raquel on the co-main event in Rio. Yeah. Now, if they both win, it becomes even bigger. Except right now, if I'm not mistaken, Amanda and Raquel are supposed to fight in Chicago. So now you're taking that, so you're, you're taking that fight away from Chicago, which I don't know if Chicago's too heartbroken over it or what. But if they did that and put them on the same card and roll the dice, maybe it becomes a bigger fight. Now, somebody just rolled the dice this past weekend. I'm not going to repeat it over again, but it didn't go well. So that's what happens is I think the UFC sometimes when they send something big, they go for it. Mm. And here's the other thing, too. Caitlin Vera looked good. Jessica Andrade looked good the weekend before. I mean, could this be that type of big fight that kind of gets things going for women's MMA in Brazil? Like, are there more superstars that are ready to come out of Brazil and, and, and maybe be inspired by Cyborg and Nunes putting it out there? Or, of course, uh, it's just becoming, you know, something that's big for uh, the men as well because we do need some male superstars out of Brazil to replace the Machitas, the Andersons, the, Bel the Belforts. A few of them are on their way out. And uh, I, I'm, I, you know, I'm not seeing, I guess, that new influx. But anyway, that's what we think. Two of us are on the side of do it now. Go says it can wait. There you go. That's today's daily debate. All right, we need to talk to Alex Hernandez. So, Danny, you want to break first, or do you, are you already got the the fighter ready to go? We can do it either way. I have not heard from Alex yet. Okay, let's take a quick and break, and we'll see if we can uh, pin him down. Alex Hernandez will be our first guest. Like Dan Tom mentioned earlier, he. Uh, Defeated Benil Darius, 40-some seconds. Put him away, man. Pretty vicious, too. Homeboy's on the map. That's Rodney's guy. Rodney, the caller right. from San Antonio. He was talking about Alex Hernandez. I, I hope I, I may have said Aaron Hernandez earlier. Alex Hernandez, uh, very impressive debut. It doesn't get any better than that. So we'll take this quick break, and we'll see if we can catch up with him uh, when we come back. Stay close. <laughs>
They are the stretch marks on the underbelly of the MMA community. But hey, stretch marks are the new tax. They are gorgeous George and Goes. It's the Impossible Springsteen ticket, and we're giving them away on to SiriusXM subscribers. SiriusXM's E Street Radio is filling all the seats for the March 14th performance of Springsteen on Broadway. Grand prize winners will win airfare, hotel, and tickets to this exclusive show. For official rules and to enter, go to SiriusXM.com slash Springsteen. No additional purchase is necessary. All right, our first guest of the day, his name is Alex Hernandez. He fought at UFC 222. He was overlooked going into UFC 222. We now know who he is coming out of UFC 222. He beat Benil Darius first round, 42 seconds. Didn't even get to see much other than just one guy uh, coming in there and doing business on a really, really good lightweight. You got to tip your hat to Alex Hernandez. We're here to do it. What's up, Alex? How you doing? Hey, buddy. I'm doing great. I'm doing great. How are you guys? I don't know what to say. <laughs> you had an impressive debut in the UFC last week. We were trying to get you on the show two different ways. One was through your fabulous PR rep, Ed Cap, And the other one happened to be a listener of our show who's become a friend, who's moved to Vegas from San Antonio. His name's Rodney. And we were trying to do it, but we weren't able to do it because of your schedule or something. But I'll be honest, uh, we, we little did we know, you know, the I guess – what you had cooking, you know, for Benil Darius. The odds makers didn't think you had a chance. Media and fans didn't think uh, didn't think you had a chance. You proved everybody wrong. Man, that's an awesome feeling too. There's nothing more beautiful than saying it, putting it out there, and then um, and then uh, acting out. You know, what you say, Thompson, which you have every right to even say, yeah. So suck it, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody that doubted you, uh, we know you're you're definitely on the map now. Um, it doesn't get any better than that, Alex. Seriously, Benil was ranked, and I'm, I don't believe you got hurt unless you hurt yourself somehow. He you broke your hand, but uh, I mean that that was a, that was an amazing debut, and and uh, I don't know I don't know what to say as far as like what do you want to do next? I mean, you could just take time to to get better, but I mean, you really really have. It's kind of different from other fighters that have debuted. I think you have some more cards to play here. Ain't that right, Alex? Alex, you there? Danny, is Alex with us? You guys He's like that? Are you connected? All right. Uh, Alex, we need you to go to a spot in your house or wherever you're at where we can hear you a little bit better. Maybe put him on hold let us know when he's ready to go. Seriously, you know, a lot of people debut in the UFC. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, well, what do you do next? And you look on Fight Pass or... At another card and just go, well, put him in against this other guy that's 1-0 in the UFC. And But when you beat Benil Darius, especially the way he did, he didn't split decision him. He didn't – there wasn't anything controversial. I mean, that was a highlight real thing. Like, you can't go down from that. You have to fight – his next fight has to be someone at that level or, yeah. or at least in that neighborhood. In that neighborhood, I think. Um, I, I wouldn't say you could probably leapfrog over all those guys, but in that neighborhood, I think he deserves it. He couldn't have written a better script. He picked up fifty thousand dollars. I'll tell you who the bonus winners here are while we get Alex back. Uh, Brian, back. okay, Brian Ortega, Alex Hernandez. They both got fifty Gs, and then the fight of the night was Sean O'Malley and Andre <laughs> Sukumtha. One last thing: twelve thousand in attendance, and the gate was one point three six seven million. Alex, you back with us? Uh, just, just still glowing over the uh, the fact that it was an incredible debut of a ranked opponent. It's different from other debuts because you really have some cards to play going forward. It's got to be someone else, I imagine, in that top ten that you'll want. Yeah, yeah. Can you, can you hear me okay right now? We can hear you, yeah. Yeah, you know, like you said, it definitely feels a lot like we have a full deck. And so, um, you know, being you just c coming into this uh, in this organization and just kind of steamrolling and everything, you know, on 7 day notice, <laughs> it was crazy. We talked about trying to meet beforehand. It was like, shoot, man, we've got all these obligations to get thrown at us already, and a lot of people don't talk about how time-consuming that is the week of the fight. And so we were trying to get our toes wet, get uh, get our bearings under us, and then just focus on what matters most, you know, and being Darush. And so now that we can breathe a little bit, I'm real excited to see what this week holds. Um, excited to see, I guess, all of our options that we have. And then just make some decisions from there. Probably take a breath for a second and just see, you know, take take it all in. I mean, honestly, that's that's what I want to do. I just want to kind of soak it all up for a minute. Um, but like I said, right after the fight, I'm already back to the to the drawing board today. Back in the gym and um, whatever whatever we have ahead of us, we do. I just like lay it all out and see see what we need to do to build it up. 
the best way we can. Here's some fights for you to keep an eye on. Iaquinta versus Felder. Pettis versus Chiesa. Poirier versus mm -hmm. Gagey. Because none of those, none of the winners of those fights, I think, will be next for um, the winner of Ferguson and Habib. With the exception of maybe Poirier, he might have some positioning. Or I should say Barbosa and, uh, and uh, Kevin Lee. But there's always the Conor McGregor return. And uh, I guess maybe Poirier is the one leading the dance after that. But anyone else, man, feel free to call him out. How about some San Antonio and Dallas? A rivalry there if he calls out James Vick. That'd be a nice one, too. Nice, yeah. yeah, Alex Hernandez. Man, yeah, pe pe yeah, people keep throwing around all these other Texas names. And, man, yeah, I mean, I, it's awesome, dude. I, I can't tell you how uh, how fast everything just kind of got shocked. And, so, and, and honestly, I don't even really look at most of these guys in the roster anyways. And so... You start throwing names around, I couldn't tell you what, what the number is next to them or where the hell they're at. The placement doesn't really matter to me either. Uh, and so, um, yeah, dude, I, I, I want to, whatever's going to sell, what the people want to see, whatever we need to do to get to the top, uh, we already made a huge impact and a great name. And so I, I just want to keep climbing that ladder and, and keep the momentum going. So, shit, yeah. <laughs> whatever you guys got in mind, what people got in mind, whatever Sean Shelby's got in mind, I'm, I'm here to answer. And so um, the first, first, step, first step accomplished now is just keep making this violent impact. Alex, that finishing sequence that you had, was that something that you were able to see in footage of Benil, or was it something that just kind of played out? The combination? Mm -hmm. uh, everything about that fight we had formulated. So I was moving with a coach. We got the fight, you know, on that seven-day notice, and I'm moving with uh, one of my coaches, and we were down in that three-point stance, and he, was, <laughs> he said something to the effect of, Yes, yes, I got like I got the energy. You look like a lion. You're looking extremely primal. Use that energy. Go stand up. And we sprung up. And I was like, man, I, that, that's probably how we got to start this fight. I just like I like the way the energy generated. And we're watching. Uh, you know, anybody who's spent a little bit of time watching the Rouge, I didn't want to spend much on him. I just wanted to get an idea of what he was like. Uh, you know, he likes to pace forward. He likes to control the center. He likes to bully his opponents on the outside. He likes to dominate. And so I knew that by storming the cage, beating him to his side, uh, it would completely, you know, disbar his cadence, his pace. I would set the tone, and by letting off that first cheap shot to the belly, that would completely disrupt, again, his pace and, and his timing. And so uh, the plan was to keep him at my range to set my tempo and then to start working those angles because I knew I'd be way faster, way more dynamic. And, and truthfully, I didn't think there was a spot this fight could go that I wanted to be more technically sound than he was. So, um Whenever we opened up, uh, hit the teeth, uh, charged, charged the, charged the uh, cage, hit him with the opening shot, and then he threw that big left hand like we expected. He threw the big left kicks like we expected. Uh, so it's just a matter of getting a gauge for his range versus mine, and that opening few exchanges, start working those angles, and then, uh, yeah, we just felt it. I, I knew, it's funny, the beginning of the week, it was like, we got this, we're going to lock this in. And then, you know, halfway through the week, it, every, every day just kept getting better. It was like, you know, there's no fucking way I can lose this fight. And then by the end of the week, it was, you know, there's no way this fight's going to the second round. And so I, di I didn't think uh, it was going to be that quick, I won't lie, but I, I, thought, I thought it was going to happen in the first. Any interview that I heard with you, that was the one thing that stood out, was just the confidence of the situation you were in, what you were going to do. Uh, nobody knows you better than your friends and family. How about them? Did they make any money? I mean, you were a sizable underdog in this fight. Everybody, I posted a picture after everyone's eating. My dad made over ten grand. Like everybody, all wow. my friends collected grants. Like everybody made everybody made a ton of money. And so it was uh, that that was half the celebration. <laughs> we, we were all together afterwards. I had about thirty of some of my closest friends from all over um, since I was a kid uh, fly out to see me, and um, and, and everybody. Everybody left a little fatter and happier, so it was, a, it was a beautiful thing to see the whole team come out on top. Man, uh, I, I just got to say, um, my man Rodney James Edgar really was singing your praises, and you came through, and I was listening to some interviews of you beforehand, and, and this isn't just after-the-fact stuff. I was really impressed with how you break stuff down. Um, j j is, there any, is there any kind of a, you know, a jobs or past experience you had that you can attribute to this? To, you're a young guy, but you sound very sharp in the way that you break opponents down. I appreciate that. Yeah, so... I, I juggled two lives for a while, and I talked about that. Um, whenever I originally I was graduating from school or college, all I planned on doing was fighting, and I kind of had my finance degree as a backup plan. And then I suffered an uh, MCL and meniscus tear that were really severe, 
and just it took a long time to kind of bounce back. And so I was sitting around the couch feeling like a bum, and I thought, man, I got I got to do something. I got to use this degree. I can't just I can't just not be doing anything. And so um, I also wasn't quite as uh, educated in, in the sense of you know higher level training and recovery and all the things that I probably could have been doing to restabilize that quicker. But uh, I decided I'm kind of a workhorse. I decided to jump jump in uh, what I could and. Um, linked up through, uh, through some successful friend connections and uh, found my way into uh, uh, mortgage um, uh, mortgage banking. And so I became a residential loan officer, kind of started from the bottom as the front desk receptionist lady and worked my way through uh, assistant roles and finally became an LO and got really successful at that. And I would have to teach uh, large education groups, uh, uh, mortgage seminars, speak in front of a lot of people and all the, all the press speak, or not the press, this is press, all the uh, public speaking that I had to do and uh, education to these folks that are, you know, my parents' age. I'm, I'm, I, when they first talked to me about what an LO is, the average LO is 52, and so I thought, what the hell is that job? And then I'm having to convince all these kids. I looked like I was freaking 12 when I started the job. You know how much of a baby face I am now. Um, <laughs> Alex, I had to convince all these <laughs> Alex, let me jump in yeah, here for a second. I, I really want to hear the answer to this, but we're up against the clock. Can you hang on with us through a commercial, and then we still got a few more questions for you? Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you, man. We really appreciate that. Alex Hernandez, our guest here, coming off a big win at UFC 222 over Benil Dariush. We're going to do this quick break. When we come back, we'll keep talking with the UFC lightweight. Stay close. And we'll be right back. Already do this.
right, we got to start off here, the second show. We're going to shut down the uh, boys, the men group there. We got Alex Hernandez on the hotline right now talking about the big win over Benil Dariush that took place this past weekend. Dan Tom, our fight analyst, had another question or two. Or I think Alex was answering your question, right, Dan? Yeah, yeah. He was explaining his uh, mo his mortgage background and kind of how that, you know, w the, the speaking and intelligence and uh, maybe even analysis skills that, that have attributed from, from his background there. Correct, correct, Alex? Yeah, yeah. Am I coming through okay still? Yep. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not here in the New Braunfels boonies. We're, we're, we get real native out here, and so sometimes perception <laughs> is not, uh, it's not exist. It's not <laughs> exist on my phone, so... Uh, yeah, no, man, I, I think a lot of those skills, a lot of the maturity, I used to think that maybe it would slow me down, but I don't. I, I think that they work in tandem, and a lot of the, a lot of the self-development that, um, that aspired and grew through that business just transcended into fighting. Um, almost like uh, Len Machinko, his dad pulled him out so he could dance for four years. <laughs> and it's like just, just the skills that correlate back. I think my mental whereabouts, uh, like you said, the analysis, the communication, uh, the public speaking that you need to be successful in this game, people think it's all about... I mean, it, it goes a lot further than just what you're capable of in the cage. You don't want to sound like a dumb chimp on the mic. So, um, yeah, I, I think that it really helped me flourish outside of the arena and really inside the arena because my mental confidence grew exponentially. So, yeah, I think the business side was nice. I decided to step away from that and uh, fight full-time. I, I quit my job, which, again, was kind of a scary thought at first because I was doing well in it, and it was secure. But, you know, nothing life really that secure. It doesn't matter if you have a W-2 at 1099 or if you're fighting people for a living. So... Uh, clearly, this was the right choice. That's awesome to hear, man. It sounds like you you you've you, you've got the package pretty well sewn together and are, are working at it, you know, as you go. But let me ask you, you know, you, you're a smart, you're a sharp guy, but you know, you you made a bold claim and you clearly backed it up. You went out and beat Benil Daryush. But something you said made me made me think. Uh, what about the ground game? If it would have gone there, um, I see on the UFC profile, it says your favorite grappling technique is a Japanese wizard sling. Is, is there stuff that we don't know about you that we haven't seen? You know, uh, as far as your resume or past fight footage would show. Um, maybe, maybe man, I, <laughs> I forget how the shit I say for those. Japanese <laughs> Uh, yeah, man. You know, most people always bring something hilarious before I got out there about me being a one-dimensional wrestler. I mean, I love hearing stupid shit like that. So, um, I, you know, we're, we're full of surprises. I'm, I'm full of surprises. So I think the more that I'm on camera and the more that, uh, you know, we get to see snippets of this greatness, we'll get to see more of my, uh, you know, the depths of my game. Uh, I... I started out on the ground. The ground has always been my first and, and, and foremost base of comfort. Um, but now, you know, the, the knee injury was what really set the precedent for the feet. And ever since then, you know, uh, my stand-up game really, really, really evolved. And so I, I say it over and over again. I try to approach every, every facet of the game, be it the ground, the clearance, the stand-up, the gauge, um, to be the absolute best at that and understand it fully and expose my weaknesses before anybody else can. So if it would have gone to the ground, there's no way he could have matched my pressure. No, yeah, he's a black belt, I'm a brown belt. I, I think that I would have. My MMA, grappling, and jiu-jitsu, I believe is far, far more evolved than what we're doing here at Ahana is going to outpress him whatever he would have offered. So I, I wasn't really worried about wherever the fight went. All right. Well, the fight never made it there because you handled your business <laughs> in the first round, and now uh, – you know, we'll await your next fight booking. Okay, so we couldn't really latch on to a name. Uh, it, it seems like you're open to whoever throws it your way. Uh, but is well, there a particular... I don't even know enough names. <laughs> I don't even know enough of these guys' names to give you a name. But, um, but I'm sorry, keep going. I was going to say, is there a particular fight card you'd like to fight at or a particular month of the year, or, or do you just want to, like, take some time and continue getting better, honing the craft? Man, every day, um, yeah, we're striving to do that. I, I think somebody mentioned something about June or whatever. I thought that seemed fine. I mean, honestly, brother, I'm, I haven't I haven't gone through the roster and started thinking about who am I going to call next, what's a good date for me to fight. We're always ready, and so whenever they want to line up that next sacrificial lamb, we'll, we'll eat. So I'll let them let me know. All right, my man. Well, listen, thanks for giving us some time here on MMA Junkie Radio. Congratulations. That was one hell of a debut. Can't wait to see who the next fight booking is. Hopefully we can talk to you before that fight. Appreciate you, brother. All right, we'll time. see you, Alex. Take care. Big shout out to Ed Cat for making that one happen. He, he, uh, you're right, man. He seems like a student of the game. He's very well spoken. Yeah, I could see him on a Fox desk soon. But first things first. I mean, it was just a debut. I feel like people are gonna think that I'm already trying to plan a parade for the guy. <laughs> um, it, it takes time, you know, and 
But, you know, those first impressions, I guess, when a fighter can make on you with their performance and how they conduct themselves, he just seems like very professional. Oh, yeah. And I can see the UFC taking notice and going, keep an eye on that guy. That's it. You know, yeah. we move on to the next card. The next yeah. card's in London. When we get to London, that's fine. You know, uh, they'll worry about Verdum and Krylov and everyone else is there. But I'm telling you, there's people that notice things like that. Uh, and, and uh, we'll, you know, we'll see. But that, yeah. that, that's just one win yeah. right now, and, and it's a big win. So we'll see what the next one does for him uh but i'm telling you it just doesn't get any better than that as far as the debut right. all right hector lombard is coming to our studio right now he will be joining us to talk about the fight that he had versus cb dalloway that un that ended uh very unfortunately for him because he was actually disqualified now we haven't really talked about this much on the show because we're concentrating a little bit on cyborg versus uh kunitskaya Ortega versus Frankie Edgar. We talked mm -hmm. to Alex. So we haven't really talked much. So these will be our fresh takes on this fight that took place on Saturday night. Hector now joining us here in studio. Good to see you, Hector. Thanks for coming on down. Uh, that headphone is yours right there. So, Hector, I was just telling our audience right now, you know, Saturday night obviously did not go as planned for you. Um, I, the fight ended with a disqualification according to the referee he said those were illegal strikes afterwards uh, a lot of people on social media you know uh, we're in agreement I have a different take on this I've watched this a few times and I've slowed it down and we're gonna see if we can also do that as well first we'll get your thoughts on it if you had a chance to see the fight and and study it you know the replays and and uh, what's your assessment of it I mean uh, I never see that before like and it the fight I get disqualified by, by him falling out with, with the punches. Mm -hmm. you know? I watched the fight with um, the fight that um, Holy Home had with for the title. Yeah, mm -hmm. versus Jermaine, Jermaine Durandamy. She hit her like three or four times after the bell. Mm -hmm. And she tried to sue, you know, kind of like appeal? revert yeah. and get the, the appeal. And uh, nothing happened. Yeah. But, you know, um, that happened in the fight like three or four times to mm -hmm. her. Um, it happened with uh, Aldo versus um, Mendes. I think. Mendes, yeah. you know, like clear punches, you know, and then Aldo won the fight. And it, it's be ha constantly it's been happening. I mean, like, it's just once again, you know, go, you know, it's, so it happened and then. I was just getting the disqualification. Mm -hmm. So it you should be no contest, you know. Yeah, and just run it back with them in the future. Is that what you would like? Is that what yeah. your plan to say yeah. in your appeal? Yes. No contest and run it back with CB if the UFC is open to it. Yes. Mm -hmm. but, you know. uh, do you? What kind of blame do you lay lay on the referee? He should have stepped in. Mm -hmm. You know, we. You know, you protect yourself all the time. He, you know, he, he kick me. You know, I follow out with punches. We in a fight. You know. These people, you know, they never been there, so they don't know what it's like. You just fighting, you know. You just in in emotion, you know. You're going through it, so um, um, it's your reaction. Mm -hmm. It's not like you try to hit the guy because he he um he turned the back on you, and you know he's he's he wasn't defending himself or whatever. He's f facing me, yeah, in front of the kick. So we actually in the fight, even like if the Let's suppose like the bell wouldn't be there, or let's suppose like there is no bell. He's fighting me. He's you know facing me and fighting me, kicking me. He's fighting me. It's not like the bell rang and he's stopping and he's turn turn around. He's just fighting me. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, uh, it's, it's it's stupid unfair again. Hector Lombard joining us here in studio. All right. So uh, my thoughts are this. I I um when I was there. My reaction was similar to the crowds because, again, I'm listening to the bell and then watching the action. But it's not just the bell that ends the round. It's the bell and the referee when he signals to stop. Now, I was a fan. I wasn't a media guy on Saturday. So I'm having a drink, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> laughing. Something. when I, yeah. Well, what happened? You know, and you see these reactions and what's going on. But I, th I think the smart thing is to always withhold um, your opinion until you've seen it, you know. And I got home and I started looking at things. And first of all, I thought your um, your defense to his kicks 
was pretty much in line the whole fight. Mm -hmm. Every time he threw a kick with his right leg to the left side of your body, you either had a jab, which you're a, a lefty, so you were throwing your right hand, mm -hmm. and sometimes you would throw it by itself, or sometimes you'd follow it up with the one and two. Yep. I saw it at least a half dozen times. Um, you respond to that. So that shows me that's something that you were training, that's something yes. that was part of the game plan, your reactions, you know, that kinetic energy that you were talking about. As a fan, we don't know it, but fighters are trained that if something's coming, they're already ready to answer. Exactly. I, yeah. It's a little bit different for me, Reaction. but, you know, boom, boom. And yeah. so as I'm watching this, I see that, that exact counter, like, at least a half dozen times. If you weren't countering, you were throwing the leg kicks, and I could see exactly what he was trying to do to you as well. Let's just fast forward to the end of the fight. Um, I froze it at the bell, and he's already thrown his jab. Mm -hmm. I froze it when uh, Mark Smith uh, says stop, and he's already letting go of his cross. Mm -hmm. I did not think that was a late strike. I think um, Mark, I've seen him referee for a long time yep. here, amateur level, and now professional level. I think he's a good referee. But refereeing is a very difficult job, whether it's NBA, NFL, M MA, it doesn't matter. So I don't want to, like, slight the guy. Right. But I think that uh, the call was wrong. Mm -hmm. And if there was a benefit of instant replay, I think in no contest, I agree with Hector, yeah. would be the right call. I and then, of course, I'd like to see it run back. But I froze it again at the, at the horn many times. And he's already thrown his jab. And then when I hit, when, uh, when he says stop, he's, he's already released his left hand. It, w it wasn't. It wasn't. A he shouldn't have been disqualified. I think. I think it's like a dance. You know, when your partner <coughs> is doing something, you're already anticipating what you have to do. So I feel like that sequence of events was already set in motion. Once he saw what was coming to him, he knew exactly what he was going to do. It was all set in motion, and it just happened right at, at that time. But, uh, yeah, I didn't feel like it was malicious yeah. either. In fact, five seconds before it happens, the same exchange takes place. Yes. You know what I mean? So um, you could just tell, you know, the fighters are, are, are programmed. The strategy is there. Their responses to everything that they're doing, you know, th they've already trained this for eight weeks, the same guy. Um Anyway, what were we going to say there? Oh, no, I was just, I was just going to add my opinion as well. I've actually had Mark Smith. I don't want to crap on the guy either. Mark Smith refed uh, my first amateur boxing fight. So I, I've been in there with him as well. I don't want to slight the guy. But you can make the argument if an official has time to say stop twice, he has time to get between the fighters. And secondly, I want to touch on Hector making the uh, comparisons to other fighters, uh, Aldo and Mendez, which I like and Dermaine and Randomy versus home and uh, people don't talk about this a lot they don't talk about from the fighter perspective which exactly. I want you to hear I want to hear more, more from you on this Hector is muscle memory and counter triggers uh, something Roy Nelson posted yesterday and I shared because I agreed mm -hmm. and there's a certain muscle memory and counter trigger whether you're counting and slipping especially if you're coming off of a knee or a block kick and you're throwing exactly. that it, it, it's all in one and people don't talk about that so I think that is one part of it the other part of it is when the counter trigger happens at an unfortunate timing. We all drive, right? Green means go, red means stop, but yellow, you ca you have to slow down, right? Exactly. And how many times when we're driving every day in the street where we're going fast, we're going fast, and it goes yellow, and you can either stop and slow down and hit the brakes hard, yeah. or you're too much in motion, you got to go. Exactly. We all face that every day, but you guys have to face it inside the cage. Yeah. And so I, I believe, my opinion, I'm not an official, I'm not saying it because Hector's here, honestly. I, I tweeted it yesterday. I believe it should be a no contest. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I, I, in, you know, this is once again. It, I never see like a situation like this. It been a disqualification. Um, obviously, if you do something wrong, you do illegal elbow, you do illegal, illegal things that you you do in the fight. But it was nothing illegal. I mean, we in the fight. They, it was just right at the time. You know, I start the action before the belt. And then the continuation, you know, obviously the bell, you know, but how can you stop that when you're fighting? It's almost impossible. I just feel like, I also feel like he he could continue. But he just, you know, once the referee's stepping and he saw the referee, that like he's kind of like super concerned about the situation, which is like he should be back in the corner and, you know, restart the next, the next round. But when he, the referee make the the scene a little bit more than what it's supposed to be, and then he thought like, oh wow, I can I can just get the win, I can just get the the, the disqualification and get the win. He just he just took it that way. I knew I knew he was going to go that way because he just didn't want to be there anymore. Well, um, I do want to finish one thing. Mark Smith um, 
the second time he said, so when he interjected, remember we talked about referees and mechanics? Yeah. yeah. Um, the second one needs to be in between the fighters. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's something that the other officials, because they always huddle up, we'll talk about. And that's something that I know Mark Smith will go, yep, I do need to do that. Um, look, again, a few weeks ago, Mergliata had um, a questionable call with the knee, you know, with Stevens. Mm. It doesn't mean they're bad refs. It just means that humans can make mistakes. And all we're here to do is correct them and learn from them. I'm hoping he gets a no contest because I think that's the right call. There shouldn't be a loss on his calm. I'd like to see them fight again. And the one thing I'll say is about CB Dalloway, you hit him pretty fucking hard. So um, I don't know. Uh, I, I've never been hit that hard, and I hope I never get hit that hard. But uh, without that experience, it's hard to say, like, what he should have done or shouldn't have done. Now, he is getting teased a lot about the fact that he kept saying what happened, what happened, almost like an oversell. But, see, I'm not in any position to go, well, this, that, whatever, because I've never been hit by Hector Lombard or anyone else. Um, and I think one thing that M MMA does want to highlight is fighter safety. So if he was a concussed fighter and we can't do it, what, what we can do is run it back in the future. But what I hope they get right and at least give them a fair hearing or whatever it is, a mediation, I don't know, is uh, he cited the right examples and – uh, again, I just think that um, I think that's the fair call. You know, is is a is a no contest. Did Did you get a chance to speak to CB at all after the fight or, or anybody? No, no, I didn't. I um, we went back um to the locker room and he, I think he he went he went to hospital. I think. Mm. See, a lot of people. What you're saying. Some people are even saying, going back to that elevator incident, mm -hmm. they're trying to say this is a guy who before has had chances to get out of fights and has done it. And I think that's serving him as an injustice right now. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, that, that's the part that I don't know. I mean, um, again, we can run it back or whatever. Hector has his opinion. He was in the cage with him. Uh, he possibly heard what we didn't hear. I, I, I don't know about that. Um I, like I said, I'd like to run it back. If he's interested in running it back and he can get a no contest, fine. Even if he doesn't get a no contest, I think the fight should happen again. It was developing in a very, very strategic fight. I was really enjoying it. So um, if it doesn't happen, uh, what what do you feel like is, is next for you? Is there another fighter or are you just going to let the <coughs> UFC dictate their terms? Have you even chatted with the UFC? You know, I haven't I haven't even talked to them. Um, I see my manager's been doing it. I, I just want to get another fight, man. I just kind of like... You know, I, I I went through so much, you know, and and uh, at the all my training camp in uh, in another country, it was super cold in Germany, and you know I really wanted to perform, you know I really wanted to kind of like show you know the hard training I've been doing, and um, I'm super grateful for all these guys to you know to push me and you know they 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 put me in uh in a in a good shape, you know mm -hmm. and. Uh, just I couldn't, I couldn't really show, you know, the whole thing, you know. But do you just do your fight camps in Germany now, or did you move to Germany? No, no, I just, I just doing my, my, my fight camps in Germany. Mm -hmm. Is this on the only fight that you've done that for, or have you officially left American Top Team, or do you still have an open door to train at both facilities, Germany and in Florida? Well, I mean, um, I love Dan Lambert. You know, he's kind of like my dad to me. Uh, you know, I know him for a long time. You know, I, I think like I always gonna have <coughs> not only a good relationship with him, but at the same time, I think like he gonna have door opens for me. But I have to get out of my comfort zone. You know what I mean? And um, I see go different places and uh, and um, be a little bit more selfish for myself for for my fighting career. Mm -hmm. You know, like staying in, in in bad weather to remember like what we do is not easy. Right, you know, like I don't want to be, comf you know, if you're gonna do this, you know, l my last few years, I'm gonna just, you know, go the highway. Yeah, understood. So. Hector Lombard, our guest here on MMA Junkie Radio, UFC middleweight, uh, former champion in like three or four other organizations, including Bellator. Not only did he win a tournament, he was a world champion over there. 34 wins overall, 19 KOs, seven submissions, uh, and represented. Cuba in judo in many 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 competitions. So uh, you've been you've been doing this for a long time. How does your body feel, man? You still have a few more years in you? Yeah, my fu my my body feels great. Um, I was keeping up with all these young guys in Germany. You know, I have a great great 
you know, future superstars up there. They have Roberto. I don't know if you heard of him, Roberto Sodic. He uh, won the KSW. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a big organization in, in Poland. In Poland. Yeah. He just won the the belt. And um, they have Abus, super strong guy, 185. They have so many other good fighters, you know. Yeah. These guys, they're going to do. <laughs> I'm telling you, these, these guys are coming for real. How'd you meet the guys in Germany? I went for a seminar, mm. and and after the seminar, uh, you know, I just love the the owner, and I'm just you know, we just connect, and then from there we just like, wow, this is my home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what are you gonna do now uh, before you you're gonna go back to Florida after this, after Vegas, a few days? Yeah, I'm going back to Florida, and um, kind of like I have to take care of some things, and then. You, will you be I seeing the UFC, or you let the management handle it? Because the UFC is obviously here in Vegas. Yeah, I let I let the manage the manager handle the the situation. I also want to ask you a question because back in the days, now that we're talking about appeal, I had a fight. Then later on, I'm gonna show it to you. Back in the days, and I killed the guy, and uh, his name was Chris Brown. I don't know if you heard of him. You know, uh, Chris Brown. Chris Brown. No. You know. Uh, it's over Olympic AFC Australia? A form, yeah, a former Olympic wrestler. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's somehow they just they they just didn't want to give me the, the the win. So the referee go and they give me the fight. You can clearly see in the video, then I'm gonna send it to you, that I won the fight. And then the next day, um the promoter says, Oh, it's no contest. And I'm like, What what, what happened? Uh, it's just no contest. Hmm? Yeah, it's just like that. It was just, I'm going to show you the video. I'm going to send it to you. Yeah. I, I think as long as they have the video, I it want, should be. I won the fight. I killed the guy. He went down. They gave me the fight. Everybody's happy. And then the next day, he's like, ah, you just, you just didn't want. Are you looking to overturn that in your record? Of course, because, okay. you know, kind of like now that I'm trying to fight this this one I'm just gonna fight the other one as well we have heard remember in Russia we heard stories like that mm -hmm. where they just said well the promoter decided that it was a disqualification or whatever if there's no commission there's no sanctioning body I suppose anything can happen um, but I guess we would have to look and see who was overseeing this event and um, I do know this a lot of fighters have successfully petitioned the sure dog or ABC um, the some fights whether it's video footage mm -hmm. um showing that they actually had a win in a certain organization and they yeah. they've changed the record in the past so it's it's certainly possible i think i've seen the one he's talking about too because you can see the video online right yes you can find the video yes and i i've had to go through and, and watch your fights a couple of times before and i was looking and i'm like well that doesn't make sense i didn't understand that i'm glad you said that because yeah. i i didn't understand why the result said one thing but if you watch the fight it's you know, clearly you. He, he was, he was kind of like, you know, uh, close, a uh, good friend with the promoter. And then, you know, next thing you know, like the promoter is like, dude, um, you, you didn't want to fight. I was like, whoa, shit. That's so weird, man. Oh, my goodness. So, but I'm, but I'm super um, um, honored to be here. Oh, thank and, you. Um, I'm always being a huge fan of uh, MMA Junkie. I think like you guys are very fair thank with, you. you know, yeah. with the sport. Like, it's a lot of fans up there, and it's a lot of the putting favorites on, on all these people because where they come from and stuff like that. So I, you guys always keeping it, keeping it straight, you know. And, uh, and you know, I have to say that, you know. Thank well, you thank you, thank you. Yeah. It's always fun to c cover you. You know, you've had, you've had a lot of uh, fights in many organizations, even back to the days in Japan. You know, yeah. Yeah. seeing you come through there, and then Bellator, and now the UFC, different weight classes, title fights, non-title fights. It doesn't matter. You've You've always had a. It's been a, a fun career to follow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hector Ups and downs, but we still here. Have you uh, taken advantage of the Performance Institute here in Las Vegas? Have you done any of that? That I testing actually and did. Stuff? Um, I went. I did. Um, um, I'm cutting my way there, and you know they have an amazing facility. It's just beautiful. You know, yeah. it's very impressive. Would you ever do a little bit, like a couple weeks in Las Vegas and a little part of a training camp? Yeah, I would love to, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's strong. That you have a big crew with you, a lot of friends. <laughs> well, this all those guys from Germany. Mm, okay. And these guys are my sponsors. Um, they are... Um, Phantom Athletics? Phantom Athletics. Uh, they made, like, the most amazing um, 
um, training, training, training mask, mm -hmm. like, and the the quality of of the product is just in another level. Mm -hmm. Is it like one of those high altitude masks? High altitude. Oh. Um, you you guys have to you guys have to watch um oh, have to take a cool. look online and stuff. But the stuff they have is just amazing. Mm -hmm. And it's a German brand. It's a German brand. Actually, we you know when we finish here, you know we you know do we have do we have um stuff for them like. Yeah, for you guys to check it out because oh. super amazing and stuff. Very cool. Yeah. Are you uh, a sponsored athlete or are you part of? Yeah, I'm a sponsored athlete. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you're not like a co-owner or nothing like that. No, 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 no. I no, see. No, in this one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're just an athlete that gives feedback on the material, the gear, the yeah. performance of the gear, and things like that. Beaches and yeah, equipments. Mm -hmm. What do you plan to do? The the you're only here another day in Vegas, but do you have any plans? I'm just gonna hear. I wanna be. I just wanna relax a little bit. You gamble? Ah uh, no. <laughs> no, I'm gonna no tell blackjack story. or poker or nothing. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you a story. And th that was my my uh, my last time that I gamble. When I signed with the USC, um, when I signed with Bellator, they gave me a huge bonus. You know they, you know they give me about forty five. You know right right away, and then they would give me. a and extra money after you know the assign. Cool. But the first forty five thousand dollars I came to Vegas and I started gamble and I got drunk. And I gambled all the money. Uh oh. What what uh what what did you gamble in? I was in the casino or sports or the dice throwing the dice and them all money. Craps. Wow, craps. I don't <laughs> I don't gamble anymore. Oh, wow. I was young at the time, I was super young, that was like ten years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, which ho which hotel took your money? Do you remember? There was there was uh, actually the one that you when you when you go towards uh, the Uber. Uh, it was this one, right? Or Mandalay Bay, where, where we were. Uh, the oh Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo. Oh yeah. Oh wow. Uh. That was in that one. That's that's why you know it came to my mind. <laughs> and after that day, I swear, like I no don't more. I will never game ball again. Mm -hmm. ever. But. <laughs> well, uh, it's a great city, great food, plenty of places to relax. You yeah. know, uh, it seems like you're in good spirits now. Now that the 36 hours have gone by since the unfortunate ending in your yeah. fight, Hector. Another thing we ask, we like to ask the fighters when they're in studio. I've never asked you this on phone in the phone, but now that you're in studio, I always ask yep. the fighters. Can you share a good street fight story from back in the days? Uh, it was uh, a good story. Yeah, a good story from you know when you were younger or something. In uh, I said fight or you just yeah you know like a bully uh, or um, I don't know just somebody cut you off I don't know like anything from uh, either Cuba or so so South Florida <laughs> or Australia <laughs> I don't know I mean, we've heard of, we've heard a lot of them so I I don't know what to say like uh, what's the most well, common usually they're at a bar at a bar or a club or, girl something, or yeah. something I don't know or at school a bully or the neighborhood. Yeah, well, um, when 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 I when I was in Australia, you know, I was in, into fights all the time. Okay. And uh, you know, I couldn't get a, any job anymore because you know it was a new language. You know, I didn't I didn't know how to sp I didn't speak English at the time. Mm -hmm. So um, I was only sp I only could speak Spanish, you know, and Portuguese and all the languages, but I couldn't speak English at the time. Mm -hmm. So um, people were making fun of me all the time, like, oh, 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 you know, because that's not my language. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just, I just got here. Like, you know, give me, give me some time so I can, yeah. you know, abort with you guys. But <laughs> and everywhere I was, it, you know, they would make fun of me and stuff. So um, I would start, start, I would start getting mad. I was like, oh shit, you know, I start. So um, I started getting in so many different fights, and it was this guy. They later on we become a good friends. Oh. That I was fighting these free free Tongans. Tongans they like oh. big guys. They're <laughs> huge. They're huge. They're so big. And uh I, I knocked them out all of them, right? And then this guy came up to me and said like, Man, what the f why are you hit so hard? I never see that in my life. So um he took me 
um, he was the one that, you know, he took me to the promoter and we start, I started fighting after. Oh, wow. So that's how I started fighting in Australia. They mm. recognized you from this. So this okay. guy, mm -hmm. his name is uh, Jim Kendrowski. And what happened with the Tongans? Where was that? I was just at the bar. It's just like, just, power, you know. And so finally you said, let's and go he, outside? Yeah, I mean, like, no, I was there right there. Mm, in the bar? And, uh, because, they, you know, they were bullying me, Carl, and I, and they're huge, and I'm a little guy, you know, and uh, and then after that, this guy saw what I was, you know, what I, what happened, he's like, man, we, we need to take you to do this professionally, mm -hmm. and that's how I um, started doing it. Hmm. That's pretty cool. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. And all of them were knockouts or any judo throws? No, just <laughs> hitting, you know, just punching, you know. Yeah. Plus, I was already upset because I couldn't get any job, and... Uh, yeah, it was, it was tough. Did the word on the street say, don't make fun of Hector anymore, <laughs> that he doesn't speak English? <laughs> he took out three Tongans, right? That's no joke, man. Yeah. yeah. No, no more, guys no more jokes about the, the strongest chins ever. Oh, man, those guys <laughs> are big, man. Those guys are big. You know, my head today, man, they're so, <laughs> so big and strong. You you said you speak Portuguese, too? Yeah. Oh, follow, nice. Follow Portuguese. Oh. Follow? <laughs> Poquinho? Yeah. No, pra no practico mucho. I know it's you, you speak it all Espanol. Si, si, Espanol. Yeah. Porque nuestra mamá es del Perú. Our si, mom's yeah. from Peru. So we can see Spanish. And I've been to Brazil a lot, so I picked up a little bit. Si just, just enough to like. It's kind of like similar. Yeah. You know? yeah. It's uh, different, a little bit accent, different words a little bit. But it's kind of like. Did you learn it because of the Brazilians? Yeah, Brazilians. Or did you go to Brazil? No, the Brazilians, you know, mm -hmm. like train, train so, so much Brazilians. And Liborio and. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. All right. Um, well, listen. Is there anything else you'd like to say in closing uh, about the fight or anything else uh, well, um, before we end the the yeah, spot here? Um, I just uh, I don't I don't have anything to apologize. It's been happening thousands of times, you know, through um, through the MMA history, you know, and once those few seconds are about to bust. I, you know, whether referee steppings or, and it, it, everything happens so fast, you know, everything happens so fast that, you know, at that particular time when you're in the fight. So, um, he was fighting. Mm -hmm. It's not like, you know, I hit him from the back of the head or I was keeping the submission and he tapped and I keep going and breaking it or like Tukino Palajares, like keep breaking it or, or he's, he was out and I just keep hitting him. He was facing me. Mm -hmm. It was like clear combination. Yeah, the bus ramp, but it was nothing like that I cheat on it. You know, it was just nice fit in a square. So You're healthy, you can fight soon? Right away. Yeah. Very good. All right. That's Hector Lombard, folks. You can follow him on Twitter, at Hector Lombard. Uh, you've gotten a lot of support, too. A lot of media. Uh, Chael Sonnen also agreeing uh, about the call. Let's see what happens. Uh, you know, I got to be honest with you, these appeals... They don't really reverse them too often, but anything can happen. But I think the important thing is hopefully whether it gets reversed or it doesn't, people still uh, uh, give you another fight. I think you deserve another fight. Yeah. Um, a no contest would be nice uh, you know, to take the, the loss away. But uh, I think at the same time, it seems like you also want to clear your name of the fact that you know people are calling you a cheater and you're feeling like exactly. you played within the rules. It was close, Even but you, I, but but it wasn't with bad intent. And now that I'm here, like, cause you know, uh, I don't get the opportunity to um, to be that much in the in the social media and doing interviews. Even like what happened back in the days with um, the the before the Usada, uh, Jeff came up to me and said, "Like, listen, you know, that product that you you got suspended. If it, we would be on board." You wouldn't got suspended because that price everywhere, in, you know, like where I got suspended. You talking about Jeff Nowitzki from the yes. UFC? Okay. And then, you know, he may actually he talk about it, you know, at the Institute of Sport with a lot of athletes. That particular thing is in a lot of products, and you don't do. It's nothing that you can enhance by. It's nothing like so. It, it was no point for me to kind of like take that because it was no enhancing mm -hmm. out of it. You know, taking anything out of it when I got suspended um, a few years ago. So I just wanted to uh, mention that. There you go. All right, follow him on Twitter, at Hector Lombard. We're going to take our next break. It's MMA Junkie Radio on Sirius XM Rush 93. Stay close, and we'll be right back. Thank you again, Hector. <laughs>
They pat down TSA agents because they don't know where those people have been and because they can. They are gorgeous Georgian goes. And this is MMA Chunky Radio. Start your day with SiriusXM. Enable the SiriusXM skill on your Amazon device. Then tell Alexa to set an alarm for your favorite channel and you'll wake up to the sounds of SiriusXM. With SiriusXM and Alexa, you can get the latest sports news each morning without picking up your phone or turning on that goddamn TV. You want right. the TV? <laughs> well, I can be it's like magnetic and shit, and there's so many channels. And I think YouTube's worse. It, it uh, TVs prevent me from having a six pack. Put it that way. <laughs> starts slumping the couch, hitting that remote, and it's all over. Some good food. My Jack Russell Terrier right next to me. Why would I want to leave, right? Um, all right. So that was Hector Lombard. Really, really appreciate him coming to the studio. You know, giving his uh, additional two cents. He gave some thoughts. After the fight, and uh, you know, we all have the benefit of watching replays and and uh, checking things out. In no way do we want to again uh, attack the referee. I think referees uh, have difficult jobs, man, in all sports. Or CB, or CB, because he, yeah, yeah, I believe he was a concussed fighter, and I just don't think they could have um, allowed him to continue. Um, the knockdown was pretty vicious, and he can only respond. I mean, I don't know, you know, like, I'm not him, you know, and and. Uh, but but what they can do is fight again, and then that should settle it, right? He was actually in really, really good shape. Both guys were yeah. really, really in good shape. Um, so hopefully they do it again. All right, our next guy, Jason Perillo. He goes, you know my buddy John Shanahan uh, that I that I uh, used to hang out with, with uh, Ward, the Tustin guys? Yeah. Turns out we have a mutual friend in Jason Perillo. I met him through Big Ralph. Big Ralph introduced himself the other day. I we would wanted to get Jason Perillo on for a long time because he's been in the sport for longer than a lot of people know. I know a lot of people are seeing him with the recent successes of Michael Bisping and uh, Chris Cyborg, but this guy's been doing it for a long time. You know, BJ Penn, these guys had a nice ride together for many years, uh, achieving great heights, and now he's got another champion in his stable. It's Chris Cyborg. She's been crowned champion in multiple organizations and now she's at the highest level of the UFC and defending. How about that? Destroying people. Jason Perillo joining us next on the hotline. What's up, Jason? How you doing? Hello, fellas. How are we doing? We're doing great, man. Thanks for joining us here on the show. Uh, really, really appreciate your time. And uh, congratulations, you and Team Cyborg. You guys got it done on Saturday, man. It was really, really a fun fight to watch. Yana uh, Kunitskaya put up uh, uh, enough of a struggle to make things compelling for just a second, you know, getting a hook in here, a hook in there. But in the end, your uh, your fighter, man, was she did what she what she does, you know, and that's just uh, blast through everybody. <laughs> that's it. That is what she does. She uh, she's definitely a, a special athlete for sure. Jason, was there a message in that yeah. first big right hand? You know, Kunitskaya wasn't. Uh, was doubting Cyborg's power, and Cyborg didn't mess around. It was it, it was almost like uh, in football, you know, like somebody saying, oh, they, they can't throw a, a deep bomb on us, and there you guys are throwing a 60-yard 60, 60 pass into the end zone. Cyborg looked like she sent a message with that first punch. Absolutely. And now that, I mean, Cyborg can punch. I mean, for this girl to think for a second, you know, she might have thought because her, her, her uh, training partner, Holly Holmes, is able to go to five rounds with her and you know, was able. You know, I think Holly Holmes put every every inch of her heart into that fight, and with all her boxing experience, with the thirty six boxing fights, all the experience that she has, you know, she's able to, uh, you know, roll with the punches a little bit more. But um, you know, I think uh, I think Oyana was was a little uh, misunderstood, read that a little wrong when she went out there. I think Chris went out there, touched with that right hand, let her know she can crack. Mm -hmm. And Jason, how is it when you have a fighter like Chris, like that, that's so dominant? Like when you are carving up these game plans, one would think it's just a matter of saying, "All right, have at it," you know, and, and blast through yet another opponent. So, how do you find yourself when you are making these game plans as far as far as being too tactical uh, versus uh, just not letting Chris go out there and do what she does? Well, yeah, exactly. Well, you know, it's just really try to just add as much to her game as you can. You just try to get Chris to fight her fight. I mean, like you said, I mean, I've said it many times. You can, you can, you can lock. You can just put lock Chris Chris up in a shack for a month and pull her out. She's going to come whip whoever's asses in front of her, you know. But you know, obviously, as we climb with the levels, I mean, Holly Holmes, such a high level fighter. You know, she had to be smart. She had to be 
you know, tactical. If you gotta, you know, if you gotta be, uh, you know, just do everything out there, be calm. I mean, has the physical ability, you know, got go out and, uh, you know, go through any of these girls. I think, you know, it's just she also wants to get better and improve, and she wants to do it in a higher fashion. You know, she doesn't want to be just a go out there looking like a brawler and a, and a, and a you know wild woman. She wants to go out there and look like a real fighter, and she has a coordination and the athleticism that you know to get even better than she is already. Jason Perlo, our guest here on MMA Junkie Radio. He was in the corner of Chris Cyborg as she defended her UFC featherweight title against Yana Kuniskaya this last sad this past Saturday, excuse me, at UFC 222. He has also cornered Michael Bisping and BJ Penn in the past. So this guy has seen some uh, some bright lights and a lot of silverware uh, in his cornering yeah, days. Tito Ortiz, yeah. I mean, yeah, the list could go on and on for sure. Uh, Goes, what do you have for Jason Perlow? No, go ahead. Jason, so one of the names that often gets thrown out is Amanda Nunes. And as we were, I mean, it sounds like a great matchup, and I want to get your thoughts on that. But also, too, it's so difficult to pick against somebody like Chris Cyborg. Uh, she just hasn't shown any flaws in her game or anything like that. So it's almost like a careful what you wish for for Amanda Nunes. But can you give us your thoughts on that matchup? Oh, I love it. I mean, I, it, I, I, you know, Amanda Nunes. You know, the way you know she obviously is a, is a pretty, you know, is a, is a good world champion. You know, and and she's the one who actually called Chris out to begin with, from what I understand. So, you know, I like it. I love it. I, you know, the, any any fight that that could draw a lot of attention for Chris, I like. Um, you know, she 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 deserves to be recognized. Uh, you know, around the world. She is obviously one of the most dominating fighters, not just female or male, most dominant fighters out there of all time. So, I mean, realistically, you know, the bigger names, the, the, the bigger the attraction. So I would love to see uh, a fight with her and Amanda. Have you spent any time whatsoever already game planning that fight just for fun? Yeah, you know, I mean, sure, a little bit. I mean, we just look at it all. I mean, we, we spent a lot of time talking about Holly, you know, months before that even came into you know, you know, came to the, you know, sign of the contract. Um, yeah, I mean, again, though, too, a lot of times it's just really, because Chris really has a good style. She had, I mean, it, it, you know, the more we could add to her movement and, and just her awareness in there and just, just just see what's going on, I mean, she should have to fight her fight. And I say it time and time again, the person that's going to be Chris Cyborg is going to be Chris Cyborg, you know, in, 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 or, or time. You know, time catches up to all of us. You know, but for the most part, you know, you know, Chris Cyborg, I, I, I don't see. Amanda Nunes doesn't have a, she's got a good style. She's obviously a good fighter. I mean, she, the way she, she, she took out Ronda, you know, I, she has a style to me that's perfect for, for, for Chris. Chris can just fight her fight and go out there and do what she does and, you know, and, and, and get it done. Um, the style that, the, the style, it, it, which is so beautiful for me, and I can even talk about this more, is, the style that I knew that would always pose the biggest threat for Chris would be something like a Holly Holm, you know, and I knew Holly Holmes was the toughest fight out there. To me, still today, right now, I don't see anybody else out there that's tougher than Holly Holmes for her, you know, for, for anybody, really. I mean, I know Holly's fallen short to some other fights, you know, and styles make fights, but, you know, the movement of Holly Holmes I knew could, you know, it, it could, you know, take Chris into the distance, you know, into the later round. But, uh, Chris's adjustment to what she picked up from that fight. We don't just learn in the gym. We actually mostly learn in the fight, now, don't we? You know, the, and I knew going to that fight, after that fight with Holly Holm, you know, the way Holly, the way that Chris was, made, was able to make adjustments to that fight as far as walking her down and cutting her off and, you know, and, and, and the lateral movement that Holly Holm has, she was able to still get to her with. You know, she gained leaps and bounds in that fight. You know, I, so, I, 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 even though I don't, you know, I don't know, I, I still think Holly would be. Uh, I think Holly. I think Holly beats Amanda to be totally honest. So I'd be excited to get in there with Amanda. And, and as far as game planning for her, you know, it hasn't been. It, it, it's the same little little conversation, bullshit conversations that y'all have leading up to it. But at the end of the day, we get Chris <laughs> right. We get Chris, you know. Yeah. I mean, right? I mean, everybody talks about. Everybody thinks they're goddamn rocket scientists sometimes with this shit. You know, you see. It, those coaches, you know, want to think, you know, oh, we got, you know, you're out there on a chalkboard acting like fuck it. This is a fight, man. I mean, it's in a football game, not baseball game. 
my soccer games. You know, there's game planning, of course there is, 1,000%. But as far as, you know, for me, you get your fighter right, you get your, and, and you cut down the, you cut, you, you take care of the holes, and the, you, you take care of what the other fighter's coming, the threat, the threat that the other fighter has, you know, and you, know, you close all the holes, you know, really, and you try to get your fighter to fight the best to make the fight, you know. You know, styles make fights, so, like I said, getting in front of a man at noon, um, it's a very exciting fight for me, and as far as talking game planning, you know, you've talked it. You guys can sit there and talk about. You too can sit in a room and and put up a pretty good game plan to beat a man at noon, you know. But it's just putting in it's putting in new action. That's most important. We got about one minute left. Dan Tom, our fight analyst, has a question for Jason Perillo, our guest. All right, Dan, what do you have? Man, Perillo, I've been a fan of watching you work since with BJ Penn you know, coming on, at least as far as the MMA scene goes. You've done a great job since then. And something that comes through, you kind of just shared it just now, is, is your realness. And I think people can appreciate that, and it seems like you have, that transfers with the relationships you have with your fighter. So I guess my question is, this might be a simple one, this might be a complicated one, depending, but... It better be a short we'll, one we'll just, we're we'll, up against the break. All right, we'll just use Bisping, Cyborg, and Penn. W which run, which fighter did you learn the most about yourself as a coach? Great question. Um, you know, I guess, uh, I, mean, I know you guys don't have time. I mean, I, I've learned from all of them. I've learned from every, I've learned from fighters that you've never heard of, you know, about myself, you know, but, uh, it, 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 you know, the, the connection that me and Michael Bisping have had over the years has been pretty special. You know, we, 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 we went on it. He was a guy that was an underdog. You gotta understand Michael Bisping in the last 10, 13, 14 fights, whatever, he's always the underdog. You know, when I worked with BJ and Chris, a lot of times they were the favorite in the, in the peak of their career. You know, so, you know, I, Gotta break. I learned a lot about this game through wins and losses through all of them. But, uh, you know, with, with, with the underdog that Michael Bisping was, it, it was definitely... Uh, there was definitely a little bit of a higher learning curve that I, that I gained off that. And your reaction after the Bisping fight was Best. gangster, Jason. Best. Hey, listen, sorry we're a little short on time today, but at least we got a little intro, and we'd love to have you back again. But uh, thank you so much for the time, and congratulations on that big win this past Saturday, sir. Appreciate it, fellas. Take right. it easy. Take care. F folks, follow him on Twitter, at excuse me, on Instagram, at Perlo Boxing. We'll be right back. We're going to do a little bit of overtime with Valio Letourno. We got trouble in the house. We'll be right back.
All right, folks, so like I explained earlier, we are going to do some overtime because we have another fabulous fighter here in studio. It's Valerie Letourneau. She's coming off a big win at Bellator 191 over Kate Jackson, so we'll talk to her about that and see what's next for her. Possibly a title shot, or you better give her something good because she's been doing this for a while. She just fought another ranked fighter in the flyweight division, and uh, she wants a taste of that gold. So give us a few minutes. We will be right No, Actually, just a couple seconds. It's just seconds, and then we'll do some overtime here on the MMA Junkie Radio Show. Now, Sirius XM audience, you're going to get additional combat sports and entertainment programming headed your way. And if you missed any part of the show, just remember that we are on the Sirius XM app. So download it to your smartphones. You will really dig it because the shows are commercial-free and in HD quality. Big thanks to Alex Hernandez, Jason Perillo, and Hector Lombard for their time here on the show iTunes audience, Facebook audience, YouTube audience, you're going to get some overtime here with Valerie Letourno. So give us about 10 seconds. We'll reset. We'll be right back with some OT. I'm gonna keep on the run, I'm gonna have me some fun It cost me my very last dime You guys, play for overtime Alright, so, welcome to the show, Valerie Letourneau First time having you here in studio, we've had you on the show many times via the phone uh, Late congrats on your win over Kate Jackson That was a huge win Thank because you. Kate was a ranked fighter I, I happen to dabble a lot in the rankings for USA Today Sports and MMA Junkie So I know that that fight had a lot of implications So, big win for you And you. Uh, first of all, I guess... Um, how do you feel about what might be next for you? You said a, a title shot. You think this one leads straight to a title shot with McFarland? I don't know if this is going to happen, but this is what I want. This mm -hmm. is, you know, I think everybody knows this is what I'm looking for. And uh, if not, anything that's going to get me any closer from this title shot. How soon do you want to make this thing happen? Is there a particular card that uh, sounds good to you? Right now. <laughs> no, I say give me, give me six weeks. I would, I would be in for a title shot. Seriously, I keep training. I've been... Uh, Traveling a lot, been learn learning some new stuff, and um, yeah, I would like to jump in a camp right now. I've seen you fight at 35, 15, <laughs> and now 25. 25 is home, that's it? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't see my, my myself fighting any bigger because I'm smaller than when I was fighting at 135, mm -hmm. and uh, but never again 115. Mm hmm now you were here this past weekend uh you're part of the group here that came along the the phantom group by the way thank you to dominique from the phantom athletics group uh for the hat i'm really really digging it here nice hat. uh thank you very much um do you want to share your thoughts on hector's fight you know and how it went down and how you see it as a fellow fighter well obviously i'm really close with hector so it was hard for me to see i want hector to succeed i want to see him successful i know how hard he trained for this fight he left everything to the side went to germany Really, they push him hard over there. He had a great camp. And it's very unfortunate the way it happened. And I don't bash anyone because I don't think the ref did a huge mistake. The only mistake was maybe being too far to stop the fight. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you really got a good point, I think, talking about just press pause at the moment of the bat and look at the momentum of Hector. We are fighters in, in any sport. You play hockey, you play soccer, you play boxing judo wrestling when the match is about to hand you don't slow down you accelerate if you sprint you're going to go faster if you race you're going to accelerate because you want to when you want to score more points why would you at 10 second oh i'm just going to chill right now so especially it's the first round mm -hmm. and um see bay cb rush to throw a kick you're going to expect something to come back it's a matter of Maybe the bell's going to ring or maybe not. You don't know. You don't count in your hand. There's 10 seconds left. One, two, three, four. So I think, I don't think CB did anything wrong, but I don't think Hector did anything wrong. And it's just like a really sad timing and a sad moment. You know. So why? I don't care that he goes with the winning money. It's not the thing. Hector is not going to get the winning for the fight. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of say, are you a cheater? Are you really did this purposely? Do you deserve to have your license, whatever, suspended and have to fight for your license back? What, what's going to happen with this? It's just a mistake. I don't think he did that purposely. And this is my opinion of this fight. I think everybody has something to learn from this, but I think he's paying a big price. We've seen way worse in other fights before. How uh, Handemi walk away with the belt. She did it three times in five rounds. 
way later than Hector. And I know home, I think, took her to court and lost her case. How does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I just feel it's unfair for him. It's just having to, it just sucks for him to finish his, his career like this. I want to see him win. Will you also be camping in Germany or are you still with American Top Team? Oh, I'm still with American Top Team. Okay. But I went there to support him and train also there because I had no fight coming up. But I went to see him and my daughter in Canada, so I was traveling. I went on and off over there. But I could see the difference for Hector and it's nothing against ATT, but the fighters that didn't care about him over there in a way that they were not scared of him. They were really trying hard to take him down, to punch him hard, to they push, they really pushed his limit. And um, he had a lot of support also from the coaches, a lot of coaching for little details that he's been fighting his whole life. He knows how to fight. Mm -hmm. But I think he was more focused on this fight. He was he, like he had the game plan and he stick to his game plan and keep re repeating those things over and over. Like you said, the shot he throw, the, the one, two after the kick, he did it the whole fight. Yeah. It's just a counter. So... I'm proud of him, even the way it happened for me. He had a great performance for everything has been working. And it's just a sad hand for, for this fight. In your case, when you don't have an opponent, are you pretty much training for the champion? Do you watch videos on her and stuff? Yes. Since, since I saw the championship fight, I had her in mind. And even the fight I just did, I think for me, there's things I've been working on. I know would be a good preparation for her fight. And I'm pretty happy about that. Um, but, you know, I don't make this last decision. Bellator is in their hands, and I know there's a lot of good girls right now coming also from kickboxing, exciting fighters. So, really, all I can do is train hard and win my fights, and I'm going to get there. Have you ever noticed whenever you hang out with a certain group of friends or family members, they have certain sayings, and sometimes you tend to start to act like them and say the same things. Yeah. What would you say is the one thing you could say being around Hector Lombard that has transferred over to your MMA game? Um, Does he speak Spanish a lot in front of you? Yes. Do you ever hear him say, coño? Isn't that <laughs> what Cuban, <laughs> Cuban say that I a lot? I cannot say what I hear him say all the time. <laughs> 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 I just cannot say this. But actually, I'm trying to learn Spanish right now. Yeah. Just now. I don't speak Spanish yet, but I start to understand a little more because you, I speak French. If you want to surprise French. him, catch him off guard. Like if he says something that you disagree with, well, coño. Está loco. <laughs> ¿Qué te pasa, man? Está loco. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> It'll throw him off a little bit. So you can blame it on me. <laughs> but make sure he's already left so I don't have any problems. And let's be clear. Blame it on him. <laughs> 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 uh, all right. Now, listen. I'm looking at these events, all right? Uh, Budapest is too soon. That's in April. You, you're not going to do that one, right? And I don't think they're going to promote a, a title fight that soon. So we'll skip that. But they're going to Missouri with Chandler and Primus. Mm -hmm. That'd be a pretty good card. That's good one card. week later, I guess. What but at least May it's states of. Ah, ah, May 25th up. in London, England. That card's stacking up. Phil Davis is back. Did you see that? I'm against sure we can LaSalle still Crow that. Cop got announced today yeah. versus Roy <laughs> Nelson. Ah, are you are you kind of telling us something that might be out there that no, if we pursue just, a little bit? I'm just I just saw a Crow Cup get signed and they announced the fight, so I think it's gonna be I like it. I'm obsessed. But it's safe to say Valerie Letourneau will fight Elima McFarland at Bellator 200 uh, I in I England. Wish. You, 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 <laughs> I wish you're it in. Work that way. <laughs> if they ask you, you're in. Mm, of course. Okay. Oh yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> I'm sure she's in too. One last thing for me. Uh, just like I asked Hector, can you share a good street fight story with us? We always ask the fighters oh in studio. God. I have a few, <laughs> <laughs> but they're all from a long time ago. This is why I think I have my nickname Trouble. Okay. Street fight. Why you guys are asking me this? It doesn't <laughs> look good for me. We um, ask. We, we ask all, all the past. fighters. We ask well, all the fighters. Uh, the worst. The worst thing, and I think most of people know this story, was a football player. Well, I was in a boxing, um, watching a boxing match. There, this big uh, football player over there. And where was this at? Montreal, okay. Bell Center, and then... An American the football player or Canadian football player? Canadian football okay. player. Pretty well known. Okay. And then... And he's... Trying to talk to me all the time, and I was with my boys, and I'm like, I don't, I don't you know, I don't care about you. I was like, why well, would my, my people, and keep trying to talk to me, and after, like, uh, he says, oh, uh, I heard you're, you're a fighter, uh, I would like to wrestle with you. I didn't like that. Mm -hmm. And I thought I was just like, he's trying to make fun of me right now. He says, oh, yeah, I did judo when I was in uh, high school, and he showed me his neck. 
So I don't know what crossed my mind, but I just put my arm around his neck. And he passed out before I can even lock anything. Really? Boom. Fell on the floor. With one arm you got him? Yes, but well, you know you go like a slice the neck. And I know when they have a really big neck, yeah. usually the blood cut pretty quick. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I was just surprised. I tell you, was, he was messing around. He fell on the floor, face on the floor, boom, broke all his teeth. Oh, shit. And he was out, oh. sleeping. People had to carry him like this, rack his feet. And he was really, really mad at me, but I didn't want to break his teeth and all that. I just... Whoa. Was there so any this uh, is one <laughs> big, big turning <laughs> that <laughs> happened. And we're cool now. I saw him after. Oh, we're good shit. now. But this is one crazy story that happened. That now, I obviously, we can just it. Google it and find out. Well, can, can you just give us the name of the player or no? It's Bruno Hippel. Uh, of course, it's not the first time we, st we talk uh, in the, the radio about that. Okay. Bruno Hippel. So he's pretty known in Montreal. But you guys I are cool. Well, we cool. We cool, and wow. you know, we other people heard this story before. So, so that's not really you being trouble. You were just defending yourself to a guy that was a little bit rude. You know what I mean? So you I know what I've learned. Mm. I don't go out anymore. Mm -hmm. I make sure I'm with the right people, and I'm not the most patient person. Yes, I'm chill, but if you push the button, I'm, I snap pretty quick usually. So. Oh, I was about to push the button right now. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna yeah. say, well, that was a Canadian football player, but had it been an American <laughs> football player, would it, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh I don't want no problems with trouble. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, thanks for doing the impromptu interview. You know, we we uh, didn't know you were in town. Otherwise, we always, trust me, any fighter that's in town, we're always trying to get them to come by the studio. The phone is fun, but in studio is a lot better that for us better. at least. But uh, at least you've made it clear. You have, or excuse me, Bellator 200, you're in if uh, McFarland's in. Absolutely. And if, the Bell, if Bellator's in, you're healthy and you're ready to go. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for your time, um, and we really appreciate it. And, folks, thank you for sticking around for some overtime. Our producer, Danny, back in New York. Thanks, man. Uh, Dan, Tom, the fight analyst, goes our ace co-host. And, of course, I took it to another level. I was fantastic. Eric from Vancouver and his brother, who actually won a world title, right? Or a, a, a regional yeah. title out there. He's got his belt and everything. That's very, very cool to see. Thank you guys very much for stopping by. Showtime from Tennessee. He's out there somewhere. Uh, and again, thank you to our guests, Hector Lombard, Jason Perillo, and Alex Hernandez. So we'll see you all tomorrow with another edition of MMA Junkie Radio. For Goes and Dan, Danny and George, go out there and be champions.